Greetings, friends, and welcome back to another episode of Dreamscapes. Today, we have our friend Dana Diaz from uh, near Chicago, Illinois. We're going to get right... Uh, oh, wait, no. She is an author, podcaster, public speaker on uh, trauma and abuse issues. Uh, we're going to get right back to her in two seconds. Uh, would you kindly like, share, subscribe, of course, tell your friends. Um, always looking for more volunteer dreamers. You can see it's been a couple of weeks since I've had an episode, so please reach out. I'm not I'm currently overwhelmed, <laughs> so I'd love to talk to you. Um 17 currently available works of historical dream literature, the most recent The Fabric of Dreams by Catherine Taylor Craig, lovingly uh, reproduced, recreated, and enhanced, uh, if I may say so, uh, by uh, yours truly, your friendly neighborhood dream wizard. Uh, all this and more at BenjaminTheDreamWizard.com. Also, if you would head on over to uh, Benjamin, the dream wizard locals.com trying to build a community there. Um, that's where you'll get the, uh, secret recipes for the cocktails. I, I, I make for each of my, uh, video game streams. So, uh, you definitely want to head over there. That is enough shilling out of me. Longest intro ever. Uh, uh, Dana, thank you for being here. I appreciate your time. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to do this. It's very different from my normal topic of conversation, which is abuse and trauma, but this has been very relevant in my life, actually, the, the dreams and their meaning and the interpretation. So I'm yeah. actually super, super excited to, to have this conversation with you. Yeah, I would say just broadly on, on the subject of connecting dreams to life experience, the more intense, positive or negative the experience, the more likely it is, say, to show up in your dreams. The more you care about an issue, the more it weighs on your mind, the, the more you need an answer, need to resolve trauma, put it to rest. Uh, what, what do they call it? Yeah. What's, what's the word? Yeah. Like, Something it, like that. Yeah. Come to terms with it. Come to understanding. Cause that's where dreams really started to, I mean, I think everybody, you know, on some level of entertainment at the very least is interested in dream interpretation, but where it came into play in my life much more seriously was back in 2020 during COVID. Um, I, I, my book that has already been published covers this 25 year long relationship that I had with my ex husband, which was not good. Mm. Um, it was abusive. There, he he had an alcohol problem. Um, towards the end of it, he actually wanted to kill me and, mm. and made two attempts after the divorce. So 2020 was kind of significant for me in that I consulted with the sixth attorney that I had, you know, during in my duration of this relationship, it was the sixth time I consulted with an attorney about divorce, because I just I couldn't take it anymore. I had actually become physically ill and autoimmune developed a lung disease as a result of what the doctors called chronic stress of living in this abusive situation. And a week after I talked to this attorney, having left her with some idea of what I needed to put together, um, you know, in order to be able to file for divorce, we go into the shelter in place for COVID. So <laughs> I'm stuck in the house with this man now who wants me dead. And, and obviously, like the relationship was beyond done. I moved to my basement just to avoid him altogether. But there was still so much tension and hostility. But my dreams became so vivid. I mean, yeah. so vivid that, I mean, here I have this green notebook. This was my dream journal from 2020. And the thing was, was that I was starting, like, I was starting to become curious about what these dreams were meaning because dreams never, at least the ones I dream, never really make sense, you know, as far as the who, what, when, where, and why. But I felt like there were certain things that I remembered about them, even if I couldn't remember the context, that I'm like, they have to have some meaning. And some kept coming up repeatedly that I'm like, okay, I need to like Google what the hell does a Christmas tree in a dream mean? And why is my deceased dog like nudging me with her nose as, as like where I'm laying sleeping. Like, why, why am I seeing her like this? Why is she trying to get me up out of, you know, and awake and out of bed? And so I started to just Google dream meaning and then Christmas tree or bloodhound dog or deceased dog or whatever it was. And I would write down what I, and it was just, so astonishing. I mean, literally mind blowing to me how relevant the the symbolism was and what these meanings were. Um, 
And it, but at the same time, honestly, it got me through a lot of that time. And it got me through to where I finally got divorced. And here I am three years and four months later surviving, you know, guns and knives and all this chaos that was ensuing that year. Um, so, yeah, I'm really excited about this. I mean, Very cool. Well, this... it's interesting even just to look <laughs> back at my dream journal and see the things that I dreamed about and what they meant and, and how it all evolved and made sense. But you know, it would be interesting to see what you think about my dreaming now. For sure. Yeah. Well, you you, you raised several things. I was taking notes uh, to myself. First, I wanted to not forget to ask about the book. I can't believe, I mean, you told me you're, you're an author and usually the first thing I do is, oh, what's the title? How do people find it? I know they go to DanaSDS.com, but what is the title of the book? Gasping for Air, The Stranglehold of Narcissistic Abuse. And it's a reference to the lung disease that I developed as a result of living in this abusive situation, nice. because definitely my mental stress was manifesting physically and to the point where I had a backpack oxygen unit and I wow. couldn't even tear toilet paper off the roll. I dropped to 93 pounds. I mean, it, he literally sucked the life out of me, Yeah, but I'm good now. I've gained, I, I'm at a healthy weight. I am safe. I, I mean, my voice is always a little scratchy, always going to be, but I don't need to use the oxygen machine anymore. So life is good. <laughs> yeah, that's a big deal. I was writing this down and I can't write as fast as I think. Um, it was Gasping for Air. What was the subtitle? Um, the Stranglehold of Narcissistic Abuse. It's a tongue twister. Trust me. It's hard to say. <laughs> All right, I just wanted to get the full title so I can say it again at the end of the show. That's, Absolutely. Uh, Thank you. This is me. Um. I mean, I say this to almost every guest off the air. We always talk first and then we'll talk after again to make sure things are, are kosher before I ever release an episode. But I try to uh, nail down these things so that I, uh, well, part of what I always say is that I'm thoroughly unprofessional. This is not, I'm just some guy in his garage <laughs> who thinks he's a wizard talking to people about their dreams. So this is not a, uh, a you know, I, what is it like? A, this is not a, um, a polished corporate product at all. Uh, so that's it. But you know what? Nobody that's polished or corporate will appreciate you like the probably not rest of us so, yeah i get that and that's fine <laughs> so it's all good <laughs> yeah there is a little bit of a stutter i want to make sure it clears up so people can hear you um yeah the, okay i think you're back yeah that's okay as long as your voice is coming all through. right discord I'm discord here. is hit or miss i mean it's the probably i think one of the best free platforms for doing interviews like this um video usually comes through good and audio but every now and again you get some you get some hiccups so anyway we're back we're back okay so yeah and we're in the midst of a polar vortex so knows what's gonna happen yeah also possibly <laughs> i mean this is we, uh, wow my brain just exploded again so i was listening to these other guys talking about um a magnetic pole shift now i'm not usually into okay i'm into it Oh. But like speculatively in terms of like, what if I used to listen to a guy, uh, you know, you're, you're probably a few years younger than me. I don't know if you remember Art Bell. If that rings, rings a bell, so to speak. Art Bell. That name sounds familiar. He did a radio show. One of the most popular radio shows on AM radio in the 90s um, called Coast to Coast AM with, with Art Bell. He broadcasted from the Kingdom of Nye in the, in the Nevada desert. And uh, um, it was not Nye County, Nevada, I think. Um Anyway, yeah. he would talk about all kinds of, you know, cryptids, Bigfoot, aliens, all kinds of stuff. And the pole shift thing, well, I, okay, just complete tangent, but I heard something recently that they've had to change the designation of runways in, in America because of the shifting of magnetic north. And that means that, so apparently the way it works is that if you're, um, if you're going to land on, you know, runway 39, it lines up with 39 degrees off magnetic north well right. if you're lined up with 39 degrees off mag magnetic north and the runway's at 38 you're gonna miss it by a, a full degree so they've had to change the names of runways to uh, keep up with this shifting now maybe that's normal but how no kidding. does it shift back and forth and, and around a, a central pole or, or uh, some people are theorizing we're gonna snap about 90 degrees of our magnetic thing and now i don't i don't know how likely that is that's where i get into okay that's theoretical but but it's absolutely true that they have to adjust 
the names of runways based on where Magnetic North is at any given moment. So wow. I've never heard that before in my life. I don't know what to make of it. I'm not claiming it. And that's the interesting. That gets us on to, okay, this, these aren't even the questions I was going to ask you. This, this is how it goes. This is, this is why I got a four and a half hour episode. <laughs> I love there. this though. Yeah. This is interesting nonetheless. Well, there's, so I, ca- I consider a lot of that stuff, even though it's more scientific, perhaps a lot of it's on the spooky woo side of like, you gotta, you gotta do some leaps of logic and have some faith in some things and historical records. And yes. we all try and, but that that applies to dreams as well there's a long history of dreams being thought of as uh, the soul leaving the body to wander it goes back to greek times um in in the uh you know kind of rationalist enlightenment uh, 1800s we're going to use use the uh, alexander graham bell was trying to invent a machine to talk to the dead and he got the telephone that's that's that that's crazy right the spiritism of that time okay well from from that time um dreams damn train of thought um oh they were trying to you know, they, they had uh theories about dreams being psychic phenomena prophetic dreams receiving messages from other people yes and, and then that's actually where carl Jung got some of his collective unconscious stuff of like we're all actually connected and there's there's a lot of layers to that and that actually goes to what i was saying too so this actually does connect Ooh, i'm impressed with myself um you talked you talked about going to dream dictionaries and i actually did an episode uh, ages ago of this this uh, series i discontinued which was the the abc's of dream interpretation just turned into a clips channel i'm like i don't want to make clips anymore i just am done with that um long story short i did an episode kind of debunking the dream dictionary approach and and i want to give mm-hmm. that and in it i that's my like 50 50 coin toss what is the what is the answer you got to pick one and i said well not good um, and the reason I said that was that a lot of those are number one based on ancient dream interpretation standards, which don't reflect modern scientific or psychological understanding. So you'll get one size right. fits all answers. What does a Christmas tree mean? As you yes. said, um, now sometimes you can get answers. Sometimes you get, um, what is it? They'll give five or six things it could mean. And if you just pick one, I'm like, okay, that would make sense to me in some ways that gets poo-pooed or dismissed as well it's kind of like um astrology they just say nice things about your star sign and you're like oh that's me uh you know although it's funny i'm a pisces and yeah that's kind of me so again i'm like i'm credulous but <laughs> even though i don't you, you know, are a typical pisces i think i'm married to one so i know <laughs> <laughs> that's why we get along that's great wait are you just just out of curiosity are you a scorpio oh close, close? in personality type Capricorn. Okay, fair enough. No, yeah. my my wife is uh, yeah. Scorpio. So, and actually, Pisces Scorpio works works very well. So, I was gonna was, I was gonna say that would be yeah. kind, of, kind of amazing. Um, anyway, more more tangents. Um, but okay, so if we what if we accept that one size fits all is not accurate for for dream interpretation because you're gonna have a specific attachment to the type of Christmas tree you saw in your dream, the ornaments you saw in your dream versus right. others what time period let's say um you saw it in the summertime in the fire pit out back laying over on fire it's a christmas tree but it's not christmas it's it's out of context so right all of that's going to modify things long story short on that and i 100 percent. so i'm going to intervene and say that when i started doing this with the with the googling and whatever that is something I found because I am not a one size fits all kind of person with anything in life. I don't think I, I am not a labels person with regard to anything at all, mm-hmm. because I think everything is unique and fits a certain context. And I think it's the context when you're dreaming, yeah. as you said, is the Christmas tree laying down? Is it standing up? Is it dead? Is it alive? Does it have ornaments? Does it not? Where is it located in a certain place? I think that it's in researching the symbolism and understanding the context of whatever it is that's really standing out as that symbol that you're trying to find meaning in Mm -hmm. is where you'll eventually come to understand what it actually means to you specifically. Because I can dream about driving a car, but am I driving it off a bridge? Am I driving it down a street? Is it daytime? Is it like you said? I I, I mean, you have to look at all of those factors mm-hmm. all together sure. to figure out what exactly the meaning of this is. Yeah, yeah, and that's exactly what I was going to say too. So even if we completely again in the in the purest binary sense said not useful, there's an incidental usefulness that actually does come from that, and that is focusing your attention on that kind of self 
reflection. So you, you have, um, it, this is the other thing I was going to say is that at, just as you said, you started having vivid dreams that stuck with you, that felt like something. Yeah. I say that my phrase is dreams self select for importance. If you remember it, there's something there that's meaningful enough to register. Um, and that you could probably benefit from 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 having a look at. So if you do, and you start with a curiosity, well, let's go to the go to the dream books, and then you start looking at things, and even, and if you do find something and it inspires some kind of a thought of going, that makes sense. Then just that process of now exam self examination or reflection, you start expanding on that and learning things about yourself and and putting pieces right. together. So there's that kind of incidental benefit. That's why I don't I don't take a hard line on like you love dream books. That's great. I've got a couple of them myself that I that I that I published that are like there's a list of all the things that they mean right there. Go go knock yourself out. I'm not gonna yeah, I'm not gonna uh, tell you not yeah, to buy my book. I wouldn't book. <laughs> go to a book. Yeah. yeah. I think those are garbage honestly. It helped to Google because there's then you know a gazillion websites that claim to know what that thing means. But there are many that actually will take the one thing and say, you know, if you're driving a car, you know, like I said, off a bridge, if you're driving it down a road, is it a gravel road? Is it a paved road? Is If you're driving in daytime, if you're driving it. So you can kind of get some sense, but you have to get good at it. I feel like I did good enough to where I was coming to some understandings with even my own like thoughts and my own feelings kind of making sense of my own psyche through it all, yeah. which is why I kept recording just the things that really stood out. I didn't pay much attention necessarily to trying to remember the entire dream and, and exactly what happened and what, but the things that stuck out, maybe it was a color, maybe it was a number, maybe I was doing something, maybe something was happening to me, but whatever it was seemed to have some kind of significance in my subconscious and wanted me to understand. So I couldn't yeah. deny myself the the curiosity to, to know. And it was, you know, like I said, I, I think when you're in a situation, I mean, I can laugh a little about it now, you know, that people might think it's like kooky, like here, this woman was in a situation locked in a house in COVID with a man who wanted her dead and she couldn't divorce him. She couldn't even leave her house to get away from him. And she's relying on dreams. Yeah. But you know what, when you're in that situation, you hold on to any hope you can yeah. to get through the next day and to survive. So it was a godsend. And, and so people can laugh all they want or judge or make fun. But <laughs> you know what, it, it got me through and, and I'm sure. thankful and it gave me something to do during COVID. Too. <laughs> That's what I was going to say is that, I mean, you could be sitting there and dwelling exclusively on hopelessness and fear. Exactly. And instead you were putting this into a, a, a process of self discovery, which, which was ultimately beneficial. It's like, uh, you know, it a, was. a lot of ways we can use our time, uh, even when we're trapped, so to speak. Um, exactly. Yeah, exactly. For sure. So let's talk about dreams now. So do you, have me like tell you about a dream specifically and you're going to tell me you're going to just break it down or how do we do this? I just sort of. Yeah. So another thing I wanted to say, we're going to we'll jump right in. Yeah. But, um, was that at, just as you were doing, I don't think anyone needs me. I don't think anyone actually needs my particular method. This, I don't even understand my method. This is just I are intuitive, intuitively arrived at listening and uh, uh, co collaborative narrative building that that just made sense to me. It's just what I do, but I think you can listen to yourself and collaboratively narrative build with, with, you know, between your conscious mind and your subconscious mind. So I think anyone can do this for themselves with, with a caveat that it's probably always going to be better to have a partner of some kind who has uh, the ability to give you a little, you know, it's like, um, you got a you get a business plan and you've got a successful um uh, friend and and you go how would you do this what do you think of my idea and they give you feedback and they ask you questions and you you come to consider things you hadn't generated in your own mind and uh you might even have them say well here's what i did and it worked for me you might want to try that and you're like okay and all that over what an hour lunch with a friend and you're just having a good time and you're just chatting right um so uh you know i don't want anyone to think that um and, you know, and I say this a lot to folks too, is like, I am actually not any kind of authority. I'm not any kind of, um, I call myself a wizard, but, uh, but it's not to, to impress. It's not to assert dominance. It's, um, you know, it's, it's what I think I am 
honestly, you know, metaphysically and all that, you know, I'm not throwing any fireballs, literally, except beverages. <laughs> that was one of my custom cocktails. <laughs> Dream Wizards Fireball Cider. Um, but so, and also I say that the answers are not in me. It, what what uh, you're doing and it, all my guests do is invite me into their mind to kind of stand behind the shoulder and and shine a flash or flashlight around saying, what do you what do you see over there? Do you see what I see? What if we look at it from another angle? And then that just like a landscape of an interior uh, landscape opens up uh, for everybody. So long story short on that is, yeah, you don't need me specifically. Uh, you you can do this on your own. And actually the more you practice it, the better you get at looking up. You, you probably found that yourself too. Like, so you started yes. with the, um, maybe you could say a little bit about your, your process there. Number one, dream journal. Fantastic. If you don't write a lot of this stuff down, good chance you're going to lose most of it. You forget it. You yeah. 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 And it just fades because we're, we're focused and busy and our, our, our conscious mind needs, to uh, the limited bandwidth, you, you got to take care of yourself during the day. You got to do your things. So you can't hang on to every memory you've ever had. It's just clutter. Um, now it's in there. Right. That's the funny thing is the, the unconscious and the minds like every experience, sensation and thought we've ever had is in our brains. It's there. It never wow. goes away. It's one of the, and that's, that, that's what forms the subconscious. And it's all these, um, billions and billions of neuronal connections now that's a funny thing too there's there's billions of connections and they're multi-connected too so uh, it, it's like the um, um you have a, a split path and then the forks again forks again forks again and then some of them connect back to each other um like roads and grids in a in a, in a city um and the the, the specific pattern a uh, uh, elect, electrical impulse and chem, chemical combination takes is the memory itself is the memory of an experience the memory of a sensation the memory of a of a thought that we've had and that's where in my estimation that's where dreams come from is these uh, the ones that are significant to us that have some kind of a meaning bubble up and and hit our our conscious mind in a way of of, of being able to recall them um well so i'm going to stop there i was asking you a question about how no, your process it's okay <laughs> i'm intrigued at what you're saying and because it's very relevant mm. to what i do every day mm. because my unfortunate lifelong experience as a victim of abuse in childhood and then in a 25 year long mm. relationship turned marriage i mean obviously i i had some ptsd to figure out when i got out of there I mean, people talk about being triggered, but they say it as loosely as they say the word narcissist anymore. Yeah. I experienced all of that firsthand, full force. But what triggers are, are exactly what you just said. Mm. Something happens in the here and now, present, visually, um, maybe it's an audio trigger, whatever it is, and it starts, your brain starts making those connections. This connects to this. Oh, this happened in the past. This person did this to me. Then this person did that. And it has that domino effect of like, oh, crap, I'm in danger. And that's when you have this post-traumatic stress, whether it's a panic attack or it manifests in, you know, some people have a seizure. Some people can't breathe. I'm a not breather, you know, whatever it is. So, I mean, yeah. it's exactly the same thing. Your trauma hides in your subconscious because, as you said, it's all there. It's just that we as people, well, me meaning me and, and, and the people that I'm trying to help in this world, I, I've had to learn how to suppress those, those patterns from being made to say, okay, the pattern's made, but we're going to establish a new reaction yeah. to that pattern, to that trigger, so that we can live in normal society without feeling like we have to be isolated and can't go anywhere and can't, you know, communicate with anyone. We have to make ourselves safe and that we call that self-regulation, but it's the same exact thing. Um, but where the dreams come in, when you're sleeping, you are, you know, dealing with so your subconscious. And so you're not actively able to stop anything from happening. But I think that's the beauty of dreams is that they can happen in a safe way mm -hmm. for your mind to work out all that muck in your subconscious, whether, like you said, it could be good or bad, but whatever is really affecting you in that moment or whatever has affected you in the past, you know, m more than anything else, that's usually what comes up, I think. So I think it's interesting that in my life, I have, I mean, for as long as I can remember, I have a lot of dreams about houses. 
-hmm. not necessarily houses that I've ever even lived in, just houses. And I've come to know through some experience with this stuff that the house kind of is representative of your mind and, and, you know, like your, it can be your life or whatever, you know, Mm -hmm. where it depends. Are you in the basement? Are you in the upstairs? How many levels does this house have? Are you hiding in the dark stairway? Like I was in one dream that I can remember from long ago. I I just remember a tall shadow man, like, you know, skulking and like I'm hiding from him in this dark little narrow stairway. And it seemed to be like the 1800s or something versus something like I've had dreams about now where I'm standing outside a house and it's burning down. And, Mm. you know, so there are things that are very relevant about certain things that you repeat dream. For sure. Yeah. And uh, dreams. So um, this is why the, not the one size fits all thing, but it, so it's, it's one of those, it's one of those weird yin yang things where it is neither and both all at the same time. And it's always more than one more than the other. But um, so if we were to say, uh, have a dream where you're in a dark forest alone at night and there's no moonlight and there's a, a a figure approaching, you hear footsteps. I think that was actually a dream. One person told me about three years ago um that is its own type of environment you know because uh you know there's uh this is where we get into the collective unconscious stuff like humans have a specific relationship to the dark forest at night mythologically it's it's in a lot of stories it's uh, in the story of the holy grail that they went looking for the holy grail and each night was told uh, to choose the point of the forest that appears darkest to them to enter on the journey and very p- powerful stuff there. So we, hmm. but, but then that's also because physically how we're constituted uh, alone in the woods, there's no civilization. There's no help. There's no other people. There's no infrastructure. Right. There's you are, you are law, of the jungle scraping for survival. There's a million ways to die. And there's, there's uh, it, so it's a very, so it, we start getting into a lot of those themes of like being alone, helpless, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And all of this to say houses, we live in them. It's like a central shelter, central to the human condition. So there's going to be a lot of, of invested meaning in what a house is for you in your experience. If every, you said you, you know, you had childhood trauma. If every instance of childhood trauma say happened in a specific room in the house, that's going to feature heavily in a dream or, or it's going to spread to other rooms in the house. And the house can be, as you said, your mind it can be your physical body. Uh, but the mind is often uh, a very common one. So this, this is, again, we get into the dream book thing. If the, if the dream book says, well, the house is often representative of your, of your mind. True. Is it for you? Maybe, maybe not. But that's a good place to start very often. That's oft, often what I do too, is I, sometimes I start with some of these vague, common cultural understandings of things that's another thing too of talking to people from different cultures and i've, I've had that um yes. i've had that experience yes. of like okay so there was um a gal i talked to i think from iran and she was flown over a river by two female figures that each had their own powers and they were basically enabling her to to have this experience of flight over a river and so we needed Mm -hmm. to talk you know for her culturally who are these women how 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 is that type of woman understood is it is it literally a a a goddess from an ancient religion in your specific area that you knew from your studies in school and we did i think we did get into some of that stuff um long story short on that yeah yeah and all of this from uh what does a house mean i don't know (laughs) let's find out (laughs) no but that's exactly true though and i think (laughs) that's relevant in a lot of again i feel like it just applies to a lot of things because we can't just we can't just say that this is this one person's you know like for example i mean you're talking about culturally when i am talking to people about narcissistic abuse even Mm. just let's say real life I don't see a lot of prevalence among, you know, like Asian communities or, Mm. you know, I'm looking at, yeah, there's a lot of like like Hindu, Indian, you know, that, that I think because they, the men are typically, I don't want to say abusive, but they are dominant and they are, the women are expected in some certain ways to be subservient to the men in those cultures. So it's, you know, what might be considered narcissistic abuse 
to an American is considered normal cultural expectation sure? for somebody in another in another uh, mm-hmm. culture and place in this world. So, yeah, it's interesting how that can work, but it, it just testifies again to exactly what you said. There's no one size fits all. Yeah, definitely. So many layers of context. And then, uh, yeah, that's that's where you, you go from the broad, like I say, collective unconscious, literally seven yeah. and a half billion people on Earth that all have common human experiences because of the way we're physically composed. We need food, shelter, love, all that good stuff. Um, and then you get down to, OK, well, what local area, what local uh, customs and beliefs and it can go both ways on that thing there can be like a, a strongly uh, male dominated uh, women expected to be subservient so the concept of as you say narcissism just right. doesn't come into it it's like this is, no. this is just normal it's not it, it, so it's a very uh, I'd say well specifically Greek uh, ancient Greek western concept of this hunter narcissus who fell in love with his own yeah. Um, with his, and, and that's interesting. It's connected to the story of. It absolutely is connected to the story of the uh, wood nymph dryad. I think Echo, and so she fell in love with him, but he's in love with his uh, uh, image in the water. His and I image, think he, yeah. I think he stays there to the point where they like, cursed him, and, and and he turned into that the flower, the narcissus. Um, and then all she could do was was call his name or repeat his words uh, back to him. Uh, that was, I, I, it's been a long time. I'm going to, I'm going to do a series of books eventually. This is another tangent, but it's going to be a wizard's guide to X, Y, Z, like, a, like, a, like the books for dummies or whatever. So I'm going to start with, Aesop. Oh, I love it. That's going to be, I'm <laughs> really excited about it. I've got like six or seven more dream books to publish. Then I think I'm out of material. Then I think I've covered everything that's worth covering as far <laughs> as I can find scour the internet and, and, and archives to, to find all this stuff. Um, First one's going to be Aesop's Fables, but eventually I'm going to get around to Greek mythology, and it's going to—it's all going to be focused on philosophical and psychological principles demonstrated by these things. And I'm starting with with Aesop's because you know when I was a kid, I, I, I would hope most yes. of us read Aesop's Fables, and we got the idea of sour grapes. If you can't have something, you pretend you never wanted it. You lie to yourself. You're in denial. Wow. And then you get it. And it's just, you know, and no one thinks foxes talked. It doesn't matter if it ever happened. <laughs> yeah. But it's the, but understanding those concepts of like, that's me. That's, that's the human experience. I was going somewhere with all of that. But anyway, that's, that's, uh, that's a project for another day. <laughs> it's, no, I love it. You have psychology is my thing. That's my realm. So you've got me hooked. I, I will absolutely buy your book or books because you have a lot of them. You have a lot be- of them in you. There's going to be a, a long series. Uh, I, I think yeah. there's, you know, I've got at least five, maybe six or seven planned. And that's like, we're, we're, we're talking, I'll probably publish the first one in like four or five years from now. Cause I got all these other books yeah. to get through first. And, um, but enough about me. That's okay. We were going to get on to, <laughs> to your dream. So talking about your dream experience, um, you were starting to say, well, well how do we do this? Um, I do like to focus on a specific recent dream if possible. And the reason for of that course. is fre- freshness in your mind, not only of the dream itself, but of the circumstances surrounding it. So if you had one last night, that's ideal. And that uh, very often happens. Uh, I'll have people go, I had a dream for you, but I had another one last night. Let's talk about that. And I'm like, that's, I think that's a programming in a sense of like, you know, your brain, your subconscious knows you're going to be talking to a guy about dreams. So you have one inspired by that knowledge of a coming experience. Let, yeah. me, let me make the most of this potential by getting something really juicy. That's really meaningful to me. Now that doesn't have to happen to you. I'm not saying you you did anything wrong. Yeah, I tried. Um, I went to bed last <laughs> night. I, I was like, I literally was laying down like, I better get a good one in tonight. <laughs> so I have something good to share. And then pff, nothing. You know, but- I mean, I dreamed, but I couldn't even tell you. And there was nothing like I had nothing when I woke up, like if I don't write it down immediately, but I can remember the ones that really hit me hard, I can remember. And I did have one the night before last. And I mean, honestly, I didn't even try to like make sense of it. I just figured I'd throw it out there because I knew you'd want a recent dream. So I don't know if it's going to be very exciting, but, um, well, You'll have to ask me for the details, but I can tell you what I remember of it. Well, all of that said, I had a little, little more just for, for context on the, on the, on the process there. Um, all of that said, if you're most like, let's say you're going to have this opportunity once we're never going to talk again. Fair enough. You can pick anything. I'm not going to limit you on that. I'm not going to demand something recent. It can be a dream from 10, 20 years ago. It can be a recurring sequence of dreams you had as a kid. It can be anything you want to talk about. 
because I know you have a, you know, an abuse and trauma history, there's, there's, and I don't say this very often, but I, I, I usually say it to guests if, if they ask about, about it, but it's a good, good thing to remind people. There's two types of dreams I, I don't do in this venue as entertainment. People are going to watch this. This is not the Jerry Springer show. We're not here to embarrass you, but there are things that are so sensitive. I will not handle them in this form. You need to talk to a professional Fair. In, yeah. a, in a private sense. And one, and one of those is childhood molestation. And the other one is, is recent or past rape experience. Now, now we can talk about those subjects in general. We can even talk about your experience, but I won't do the, I won't risk the potential harm of doing a bad interpretation for entertainment's sake with a person who's having ongoing current nightmares right. about these past experiences you need like real dream interpretation in in a psychological context you would you could spend three to four months of regular weekly sessions talking about one dream in depth and making the most of it privately that we do you know two hours and and we just chat and try to have a good time and and it isn't because that material is too dark and i wouldn't but i don't want to risk doing it badly like i said for the sake of entertainment i'm not gonna no and no risk. worries there long, long i figured short. i was just gonna throw this like you said it's fresh and i didn't write anything down i just figured and i still remember it pretty clearly so nice. i'm like it must mean something so you're gonna help me figure this one out we'll Absolutely. do it together yeah for sure okay so yeah as i say my process i just uh, shut up and listen you tell me the dream uh beginning to end how it unfolded and then we'll uh we'll go from there so i'm ready when you are okay so Benjamin the Dream Wizard wants to help you pierce the veil of night and shine the light of understanding upon the mystery of dreams. Every episode of his Dreamscapes program features real dreamers gifted with rare insight into their nocturnal visions. New Dreamscapes episodes appear every week on YouTube, Rumble, Odyssey, and other video hosting platforms, as well as free audiobooks exploring the psychological principles which inform our dream experience, and much, much more. To join the wizard as a guest, reach out across more than a dozen social media platforms and through the contact page at benjamintheDreamWizard.com, where you will also find the wizard's growing catalog of historical dream literature available on Amazon, documenting the wisdom and wonder of exploration into the world of dreams over the past 2,000 years. That's Benjamin the Dream Wizard on YouTube and at BenjaminTheDreamWizard.com. I'm ready when you are. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to ask everyone's forgiveness because when I remember dreams, I remember I mean, there's not like a whole long story to tell. It's usually probably whatever ran through my mind before mm -hmm. I opened my eyes and what I can remember. Um so I'm getting on an airplane. The airplane inside of it it's daytime by the way. I there was light coming in through the windows on the airplane, but it wasn't a typical airplane. I felt like, like when you get on an airplane, there's normally like the middle row of seats and then the two, you know, banks of seats on the side. This was more like a first class, but I mean, to say there was leg room, like my seat was right in front and center and there was one next to me meant for my husband, but he wasn't there yet. I, I remember feeling like, where is he? Is he going to make it in time? Is he going to make the flight? But there were maybe three seats across total. I mean, and they were very spread out. It was very wide, very open. It almost felt more like a living room, but it was clearly an airplane, if that makes any sense. And <laughs> the weird, two weird things about this was I was dressed like to the nines, wearing a blouse and a skirt and high heels. And anyone that knows me knows that good luck trying to get me out of leggings and a, and a t-shirt or leggings and a sweatshirt. Not my thing, right? I mean, I can clean up if I have to, but it's not who I normally am. And the other weird thing was that I brought a pet on board with me. Um, the pet was this huge, gigantic, full-size lion <laughs> that I was leading with a leash. It had a beautiful collar. I remember it sparkling, probably diamonds or something, because they were definitely stones. 
And it was very well behaved. It never roared, not even once the whole dream. It didn't make a peep. It just sat next to me, you know, just as a dog would or a cat just kind of laying there and I would pet it. Um, But I held on to the leash. I never let go of it. So there were maybe two or three other random people. I have no idea who they are that were, you know, on board this one room airplane, basically, (laughs) that we took off and my husband still hadn't made it. And I was still like, why didn't he get on the plane? Where is he? But then the next thing I know, I'm standing at like, I guess we had like a little bar area in our on the plane in our section, at least. Not that I thought there were other sections. I didn't see any. Um, But the waitress or the waitress, the flight attendant said, you know, could I get you something to drink? And all I wanted was peanut M&Ms. Now, as an aside, I do love peanut (laughs) M&Ms. So that is my favorite little, you know, snacky snack if I I indulge myself. But I'm not a a junk food eater. I do eat very healthy. So I'm snacking on these peanut M&Ms just standing at this bar holding the leash of this lion that came on board with me. And you hear on the overhead, the pilot says, oh, we're going to have to return to the airport. You know, we're having problems with the plane. So then the next thing I know, you know, the plane has landed, but it's not like the landing of any plane. It's like we were there and then all of a sudden we were just back down on the ground and they opened the door and there was a little stairway And me and my lion just, you know, traipsed on out like nothing. And we were basically standing in the middle of this, seemed like a parking lot, not quite a, it didn't even look like I was at an airport outside, Um, but just standing there. And again, it's still daylight. It was a little cloudy out, um, but there was nothing else really relevant or prevalent. My husband never did show up. Um, And then that's kind of when I woke up and I don't know. I don't know what any of that means. Yeah. All right. Ooh, good one. Wrote as fast as I can. Like I could, I could, I swear to God, I could hold this up to the camera and no one could read it. It's just, that's how it is. I've got my own, got my own little chicken scratch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> good. That is beautiful. That's, uh, now it's, it always amazes me and it happens every time people go, well, it's not a very long dream and I don't remember much. And I write literally two pages of notes. <laughs> Because <laughs> every little, I'm trying to capture every little detail, and, and particularly sometimes the way it's told, um, the particular phrasing you use. I mean, a couple of things jumped out to me just to, um, um, it felt more like a living room. Very interesting. I mean, that that's the, you know, and I'm not, what I don't do is pin people down to what well, you said, but but more yeah. like that just spontaneously, came, what, what was the feel of the openness of the space? A living room. Okay. Interesting. And the idea that your husband was not on board. Now I wrote that phrasing down, but that that is how I conceptualized it at the moment of like, you know, it's, so he's not with you. And and there's with you physically and there's with you supportively maybe to be the idea of being on board with an idea. Yeah. I, now, I don't know if any of that is actually they're calling me to tell me they're not going to pick up my garbage again. We've had an ice storm here and the garbage company keeps saying it's not safe for our drivers. I'm like, I went to work yesterday. Get your ass out here. <laughs> um, I know. And then you see them <laughs> driving down the road and you're like, I'm pretty sure that yeah the world is safer without them on the road anyway it got, yeah, maybe that too I no. oh i just saw it. okay <laughs> random tangent i'm browsing twitter and whatnot uh i saw a video of icy roads in a suburban neighborhood somewhere in the in the midwest and it was a um a fire engine truck huge heavy you'd think they would you know have the best possible yeah. traction they probably have studded tires and this thing was spinning loop de loops down the road and just barely missed cars and missed houses oh and my gosh. it actually it was coming down the road and there was a little you know an intersection and it zigged over and zagged over again and it spun perfectly through this and and down the, the next road it could have gone into a house it could have gone into a car it didn't unbelievable so yeah Um, that is unbelievable so if there's icy roads and and the uh, garbage trucks uh go out of control that's probably very bad things i I don't blame them but (laughs) but then again my garbage is pretty full it needs to go somewhere sometimes yeah right (laughs) yeah i'm paying for this let's go um okay so my process we shut up and listen and then we go back through it again so you um 
the initial environment, you appear in the dream. The first thing you remember is being on the plane. Yeah, I'm walking up the stairs into the plane, but I, w- I okay. wasn't, when I remember the opening, I'm walking theoretically the same stairs that I walked down to get off of it. And there were only maybe a half dozen stairs. So this is a very low (laughs) to the ground, very small airplane, I'm guessing, because I don't remember, but maybe a half dozen steps, but I am already like, I, it's like I got the last step or two up on the plane and I'm in there and I've got this lion on the leash and I never once let go of this leash. Yeah, that was the other thing I was going to say is that you thought to mention that. You felt the need to mention that, that I mm-hmm. had this lion under control. It was never out of my control. I never dropped the leash. He never yanked it out of my hand. So um, there's something in there that feels important to you. The idea of. Yeah, of, of it was ha- a very docile. I mean, very docile animal. I Yeah. It made no, it, it just, I don't know, it was almost statuesque, but but moving very gracefully as it walked. And I mean, it was very much alive, but just it didn't yeah. make a peep and it was very well behaved. And that's an interesting thing too, that there's a recognition of the potential for danger in the idea of the necessity of a leash. And it's a very pretty leash and you're not cruel to the animal, but <clears throat> even though it is well behaved and probably in your in your mind or in in um if we if we say in reality the idea of a if there was a perfectly docile lion that was just calm and you could be guaranteed it was never going to hurt anyone you could probably go without the leash and it would just follow you but there's something in your mind that says you know even even the um the most well-behaved lion is still a lion and you cannot let go of the leash there's something in there and it's yeah, and now that you're see, this is why I'm glad we're we're bouncing these ideas. I yeah. should also note that that flight attendant, female flight attendant, and I remember seeing, like in my peripheral vision, at least two other people on board, so to speak, in this section. But I never actually saw them. I couldn't tell you if they were male, female, or whatever. But nobody, the flight attendant specifically, the only one I really interacted with. Well, the only one I did interact with. Nobody was fearful of this animal being with me either, which was strange to me. I yeah. in, in in real life, not in the dream. In the dream, I didn't think anything of it, but I thought, wow, that's weird that nobody was. Because I'm sorry, I I actually have been that close to a lion, and as much as I love animals, um, yeah, they're pretty scary. It, it can eat you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if it if it decided to, and that's I would say. Um, it very well could have been that you saw other people on the plane and you had no concept of what they were thinking, but you actually okay. put them there to show that say, um, that, let me rephrase that as it, it seems like you may have, uh, the, the, the idea occurred to me that you might've put them there to show that even other people reflecting their opinion of your behavior in that scenario, they would have been fine if you had dropped the leash. They had no fear of the lion, huh, but you chose, but you chose not to. You said this leash is not going to be out of my control um, in at any moment. And, and, and you, you did actually mention that, like, I think three, maybe four times in the description of like, and I didn't let go of the leash. <laughs> I had the leash in my hands. Uh, the lion was still on the leash. Uh, so there's something very, very important in there of that. of uh, and, and, and the word control comes to my mind. And that can be good or bad. I mean, we want self-control, self-regulation, as you say. Uh, we also don't want other people to exert their control over us. Um, mm-hmm. we, so there's, and, and that's a very common theme, say, and this is why it's great you talk to people before you get where they're coming from. Oh, trauma and abuse survivor. Uh-huh. That's very typically, you're out of control of those. They happen to you and you cannot stop them. There is a complete lack of control. So a lot of people go overboard in trying to make themselves feel safe. And it's fully understandable. I will exercise hyper control because that is how I keep myself safe. When control is gone, I am not <laughs> safe. You I'm gonna, are I'm gonna stop right there. No, you're a hundred percent describing a lot of what I am. I have been told in my life in a lot of situations that I am bossy and that sometimes I can be controlling and I it's not coming from a bad place and it's not ill-intentioned. It's not a power trip. For me, it's 
if I can control things around me, then I feel safe. Absolutely. And, and for me, safety has been an ongoing issue in my life. Mm -hmm. I am safe now, you know, the last three years, but the first 45 years of my life, I did not feel safe. So yeah, and even part of me feels like holding on to that lion for me was like a security. Like I had something very powerful. Yeah. In my, in my, basically literally in my hands that if something went awry, <laughs> that I felt that perhaps, not that I can control what a lion does, but maybe I could release the beast if I had to. Yeah. Just throwing that out there. But no, you, you, you absolutely hit the nail on the head with that because security and safety for me it, and will probably always will be something that that will stay with me forever as a, a core part of my being i absolutely yeah. need to feel safe absolutely and 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 again uh, there's a lot of people who i okay where where do i start with this <clears throat> i'm very strongly libertarian i'm uh, i love my cats i'm kind of a cat uh you know you, you can feed me and pet me when i want you to otherwise leave me the fuck alone uh it's I agree. A, right <laughs> so there's there's a very strong streak of like i do yeah. not like being controlled and i have a very strong ethical standard personally of i don't exert control over others this absolute you know uh consistency of, of moral principle on that one is like you know uh do unto others etc this is this needs to be reciprocal respect in, in, right and that's yeah in that sense so there's nothing wrong with control it is it absolutely new you want to be in control of the damn car when you're going down the road at 90 miles an hour that's good, yeah. good control you want control of your emotions so you don't flip out and make make bad decisions right. and you want to be in control of your own decisions in general and not have other people forcing themselves on you it's, it's absolutely unacceptable um and and yes may i insert on that please. thank you for you you hit that before but i do want to speak to that because in my childhood it was my narcissistic stepfather he was mm. physically and verbally abusive but i mean what he said goes and and my mother submitted to it my brother i was the one that was like no this isn't right i don't have to do it like i am a free independent thinking human being i was a tenacious little thing <laughs> but <laughs> that's what got me the physical consequence mm. and that's and you know i was the one basically exiled from the family you know, well, yeah. he did. He told me that I, I'm not a part of his family and, and I have been banished and we're estranged and my mother doesn't even have anything to do with me. Oh, that's but sad, yeah. same thing in my marriage. I was married to a narcissist the first time around. So what I'm saying in reference to what you just said is that everything was dictated to me. And I don't think people understand I was not submissive or weak by any means. I, yeah, I had a just, mouth on me. Just overpowered. I fought yeah. it. But yes, in order to appease and keep myself safe when I didn't want to be physically harmed, I had to give in. But when I say dictated, I mean everything. I was told what I couldn't 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 wear i mean my ex-husband was really bad with it wow. what I, I he didn't even like me wearing a certain lipstick i didn't even have a smartphone until after our marriage ended because he didn't like me on the internet wow. he didn't want yeah. me having outside influence he didn't like me reading books now i write them so haha -ha. he told <laughs> me i talked too much so i couldn't talk when the tv was on because it would interrupt him and the tv was always on so Jesus. there were all these rules and restrictions that I was yeah. held down to. And so control for me is a very, I mean, we can call it a red flag or whatever, but, you know, I'm not a bad person. I'm not some wild animal that can't be trusted, unleashed in the world. <laughs> no. Yeah. But control concerns me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that's fine. And this is, that's why we, we got to look at these things like, um, in the most neutral judgment for you, which, which, which therapy should be there a therapeutic interaction, whether it is capital T licensed oh, counseling and therapy or not. But, yeah. but so none of this is to say, Oh, you got control issues and you need to change that. No, it's control can be a good thing. And so if we conceptualize the lion as an aspect of yourself, you've got the, you've got this 
tremendous. And as you you mentioned it too, I, I put the, the the power of self protection is what I wrote down when you were talking yeah. about um, holding the lion. You've got this, uh, and what is it? There's a there's a saying. It's better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. So the lion oh, is in okay. in a way like your inner. It, 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 this is an old Japanese saying, I think. It's like your inner samurai in some sense. Yeah. You've got it on a leash. <clears throat> you can unleash it if you want to. It's perfectly harmless to anyone that doesn't seek to harm you. That's why I like the, uh, that's what, again, going the libertarian mm. side of things. I'm the, I'm a big believer in fuck around and find out. And if you do not fuck around, you'll never find out because I'm not going to uh, start no shit, take no shit. That's it's kind of that, that, that type of thing. You don't, you don't want a problem. Don't start a problem because you're not, because I'm not going to start the problem. Um, so it's, it's very good to say mm-hmm. I have, if we conceptualize it this way, I have within me a leashed lion that I can let off the leash if I need to. And he's not dangerous to anyone unless I need to let him off the leash. And that's up to you. Uh, so I, I think there's more of that kind of yeah, power of self-protection. I'll stop for a moment. Um, yeah, no, you are. You, I describe myself very much that way, even the fuck around and find out thing, because I am not a vicious person. I mm. leave karma to karma because I always say she's a bigger bitch than I'll ever be. But... <laughs> I am very much that person. And again, I think that control issue is more for me. It's, I like to, I I feel like I've just taken my life back three years ago Mm -hmm. since releasing myself of all of these people, all of these people who have caused me harm in my life. And so for me, that control, like I said, is not meant, it's not a bad thing. It's me taking control of my life, but I very much have it in me. I mean, you know, they say you can be holy or go hood. And well, you know, yeah. I mean, I could be a lot worse Yeah, and you in can be the worse. right situation if provoked. But I have worked very, very, very hard to handle myself correctly and not be that person mm-hmm. because it's not who I really am and it's not who I want to be and it's not who, how I want to present. And that's why I say I, I, I've... I think all this has to do with like the healing that I've done in the last three years For that sure. I am, I have kind of taken the power back of my life. I have taken back control of my emotions and, and, and not, you know, I think say go off the deep end. That's my husband's term for things. But, (laughs) you know, there were things that two years ago, somebody could even look at me the wrong way. And I'd go cry for three days about it, about, ooh, why don't they like me? What did I do? Boo hoo hoo. And now I'm just like, okay, well, I'm not for everybody. You know, like I'm good with it. Much healthier place. So I've come more into my own um, through the healing and through taking back my own power and and my own myself and my life yeah. and so i feel like that all plays into this absolutely and uh, broadly speaking there's kind of two ways people respond to to this kind of trauma and one is i think the the, the healthy route as you have done establish the 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 uh, inner power of self control and healthy healthy mm-hmm. boundaries the opposite way that a lot of people go and it's it's you know it's it's hard to say it's not their fault, but it isn't. It's one of those, again, yin-yang things. It it's is, touchy. It, it, I bo- know. it both is and isn't their, their fault. But uh, to do it poorly, shall we say, is to then repeat the pattern and say, well, I'm going to establish my inner power by dominating others. I'm going to replicate it. Right. I'm going to become the abuser because that's power. And Well, it's interesting. That's <clears throat> how there are two ways that a narcissist is created. And that is one of the ways, exactly mm. what you just said. Yeah. where they seek then to basically repeat it and do the same to others so that they fulfill their need to feel all powerful and exalted and, and all that stuff. Yeah, so. for sure. So what you've done is, is <clears throat> I would say, you know, the, uh, um, there's exerting control over others and there's exerting control over yourself in terms of, um, uh, also, uh, th- th- there's a discomfort that comes with establishing boundaries. Oh, oh yes. if I, if I, if I, don't do what this person wants me to. They won't like me. So there's a personal power in being able to say it's okay if you don't like me, but, uh, but also you've picked a new partner that I would imagine is very, what am I saying? You know, gentle with your boundaries, like knows your history and, and shows pretty extreme (laughs) respect for your process in a way. Um, I've known his family for about 18 years and I knew him for, I'd say five or six years. So yeah, he, he absolutely knew my 
we live in a small town too, so mm. everybody knows everything. But yeah, he absolutely knew. Otherwise, God, I wouldn't be married. <laughs> I wouldn't even be dating right now. I'd be scared. But mm. yeah, he. I call him my gentle giant. He he is a a tall, big hunk of a man. Six what six five two twenty. You know, mm. big guy. Yeah. I'm five three, like a hundred. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. He's he's my protector and my gentle. He he's been to say he's patient and understanding. He's been a lot of things, but mm. he has definitely given me that space mentally and physically, really, to just do what I need to do. Mm-hmm. You know, to resolve the past and and to move forward however I want. And and it's a beautiful thing. It, it's a very nice situation, and so far from the life I knew before that. But sure. yeah. I feel very strongly about being accountable for myself and for, you know, being a better person and, and taking control of all that ugliness and, yeah. and making a better, you know, using it for a better purpose, which is what my ultimate goal is. Yeah. I, and I'd say that makes all the difference. It's like your your ability to understand what you went through and 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 take um accountability for your own actions in a way, you know, to, to realize you are responsible for what you choose to do, whether to replicate this or not. I think the, the work you've put into it and the, 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 the way you understand it is probably what allows you to get the benefit of a good man like that, you know, cause you could have, if you were not working on yourself, if you were not and working on yourself is so hacking cliched type of to always work on yourself. You know, you got you guys work know, to do, but, but it, it's definitely, it's <laughs> self-reflection and understanding and patterns yeah, and habits. There's a lot. And, there's a lot. There's yeah. a lot. Um, but if you weren't doing that work, like he probably wouldn't put up with it either. It'd be like, you know, you're kind of a mess and you're, right. and you don't seem to want to change. So, uh, thank you. No, thank you. Not for me. He would still be gentle about yeah, it. But he's he, very you know. gentle, but he holds <clears throat> me accountable, you know, yeah. and that's what I, that's, the beauty and and, you know we can go on about our relationship but I think that is you know the boundaries thing though that definitely spoke to me because that was probably the one thing I had the most difficulty with because I had always been a people-pleasing codependent because everybody had to I was so scared of disapproval because I could never to this day I could win the Nobel Peace Prize and my mother and stepfather could they'd still somehow find a way of dismissing it or disacknowledging the achievement, you know, so approval was huge. So the last few years learning to say no and and finding out (laughs) the very hard way who didn't like that and who was really in my life using me and taking advantage of, of my inability to say no or set a boundary was heartbreaking. I lost a lot of people, not just, divorcing, not just in the yeah. exile from family when I am exposing abuses that they are not ready to hear about it and acknowledge themselves. You know, I lost dozens of people yeah. just that are still alive, which is even worse because, I mean, knowing that it, it, it's a rough, it, it's yeah. been a rough patch, but that's, that's I awful. feel good about myself and I feel, you know, maybe I'm like the stoic lion. I feel that <laughs> I have held myself to a higher standard and held myself well there. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's another great way to understand a, a slice of the line anyways, that you have um, a, probably within you a power to do great harm if it were unleashed and and that doesn't oh, mean yeah. that doesn't mean there isn't a a, a, a a context in which unleashing lion is a good thing for self self-defense we would say the difference between self-defense and murder you just let the lion off the hook and go murder you could have torn up a whole plane if you wanted to but you right. don't you hold you hold that leash that's your leash yeah you are in complete control of that um another direction so it it struck me and I'm, I'm glad we had a lot of other conversation about it first is that you know you're you notice your husband isn't present. There was a seat for him. He was supposed to yeah. be there and his absence was notable in, in that it registered and you, and you remembered yeah. it and shared it. I was wondering, is the husband the lion? But it seems like we've gone in a complete different direction. That's why I love doing these things of like, uh, no, talking I'm glad through you it. said that. Yeah. Yeah. Because as we've been talking about the lion, honestly, a couple minutes ago, I wondered the same thing. I just didn't yeah. speak it. Well, there because really, that is who he. Is. I mean, that's his nature. He's quiet. 
he doesn't, and again, I'm talking about just sheer size alone. Hmm. You want to talk about a man that can cause some damage? <laughs> he can cause some damage to, to things and people. And he wants to, you know, just knowing what I've been through. And, and he's even witnessed some things that, you know, he's expressed <laughs> his desire to do things to people. And I'm like, but we're not going to do that. We're going to yeah. be better than that. It's okay and, to have thoughts. So, yeah. Very much in that way, I wonder, I'm wondering the same thing because he is, he's, I call him my gentle giant, but let me tell you, only twice that I can think of in the time I've been with him, I have seen the other side of him and it's scary. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and and I, I don't want anyone to think he didn't do anything to anybody, by the way. A disclaimer here. He didn't do anything to anybody and nothing was directed. It was all verbal stuff. But he holds he holds things within. He tolerates a lot. He has a very forgiving and tolerant nature. But boy, when when he has been pushed those couple of times, I would not want to be on the other end of it. Yeah, definitely. And that's, again, framing these things contextually properly is like you don't want to be a weak person. You want to be an absolutely deadly person who has it under control. And that means it's a mm -hmm. choice. It's that you're not harmless. Uh, you're, you're not a bunny rabbit. You know, you're, you're more of a, of, of, a, of a tamed lion in a way. And that's you, me, the, the grand you, the, the royal we. Um, right. <laughs> now, now, there may be an element where, there, where your husband is analogous to the lion, and that might be part of it. But the reason I'm glad right. we talked about it before is that I don't believe you think you have your husband on a leash. I don't know. Gosh, no, yes. not even close. Yeah. That's why I'm like, he this. is a Pisces. Remember <laughs> you Pisces. Let's just be real. This. I say he blows with the wind and I think you do too. Yeah. This. Whereas I'm a, I'm a structured type, a Capricorn that <laughs> things have to be just so, and what's the schedule. And yeah. so it's very opposite, but it works for us for some, we, we kind of are that yin and yang that balance each other out for sure. Yeah, yeah, in, in, in the in the Pisces, Piscean sense, if we would say, uh, there's no leash going to hold us. We're we're no. our, our, head, our heads in the cloud, like, <laughs> no, and actually, I don't even try, and I wouldn't want to. No, no, no. That's what that's what I was saying too. Is that I think there's an analogy there to the husband of like, okay, he's like in a sense a tamed lion, destructive capacity, but docile, under control, no threat to anyone, but don't fuck around. Um, but but the the, the in important connection was that you don't conceptualize him or your relationship that way as in you exerting control over him so i think that's disanalogous and i think it's better we talked about how it's more of an inner strength type of thing recognizing okay. your own potential yeah then that's that's i think the benefit of talking to someone else about this type of thing where they go i don't think that's you i don't think that's something you would conceptualize in that way based on your circumstance um so but it's always good to entertain the thought and and think it through and say okay well it fits in some ways but ultimately not so much um yeah, but I will argue the. I'm one of these devil's advocates. Sure. So I'm always going to argue the point less, you know, that that we're dismissing. At the same time, the leash was sparkly and pretty, and and I mm. remember like I don't know if they were diamonds or aquamarines, but a light, like I mean, they were white with like a blue kind of iridescence to them around the collar. So, where I'm going with this. I mean, if we went the route of the lion is the husband kind of a thing, which does make some sense, a lot of sense, actually. Sure. The one thing I will say about my relationship with my husband, no, there's no leash. I, I wouldn't even want to put a leash on him. However, he and I are very connected, and he is extremely, extremely protective of me. Mm. So... The fact that it's a pretty leash, and I mean, I never at any time was pulling on it. I mean, it was always hanging, and the line was just oh, yeah. always right with me Slack. and right next yeah. to me. Because, I mean, my husband, he he doesn't even let me warm up my car in this store. Like, he is, it's like <laughs> Princess and the Pea, but he's never very far. Even if he's far, he's never far. He's very, very, very protective of me because of what I've been through. And always just wanting to make sure that I'm good and I'm safe and I'm cushy and I'm happy and in every way possible. 
but not in a controlling way either. Mm -hmm. You know, I always, I always describe it to people as when I'm talking in the realm of trauma and healing and healthy relationships that in my former marriage and, and even in my childhood, I felt like a caged bird. I was lucky if I got any nourishment and oh, yeah. or attention or anything. But my husband, I feel like I'm that same bird, but he holds me in the palm of his hand. And I'm mm. free to fly and do and be, but he's always there with his hands. And I can always come back there, you know, and return to him. And I always do. And he knows I will, but he's always there. Yeah. If that Good makes deal. any sense. No, no, it does. And I'm glad you push back a little bit and press because a new thought inspired. So there's the aspect of um, lion on a leash, self-control makes perfect sense for you. The, 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 the key phrase popped into my head, a leash being a secure connection. Like a like secure a attachment. attachment. And it's That's pretty. The word I was it's a for. nice one. It wasn't like, you know, like the leather with the spikes or anything. I mean, it's a pretty like I'm holding him like a, a jeweled crown. Like I'm holding this hot lion in very high regard. Yeah. And he's coming with you that the 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 leash is always slack. He's a um yes. a, a traveling companion in a way versus a yes. a um you know, there's no there's no reins, there's no whip. You know, this is not lion taming in a, in a, in a circus. It's very different, very different context. No, but so. the secure attachment is a big deal because yeah. I've always felt very, and this is just another thing from my traumatic past. Remember, my mother, well, I didn't even mention this before. My mother didn't even want me before mm. I was even born. She didn't want me. And obviously her husband wanted me even less, but I never felt like I belonged. And I was told, my stepfather told me when I was a child that I was not part of their family. Mm. They were married. They had their own kid. I was just there and they just had to feed me and shelter me until I was 18 and could have cared less about me. So there's always been this feeling of detachment. And in my former marriage, part of the reason I stayed so long with this man was because I fell in love with his parents. They were the loveliest people. And they treated me like a daughter. And his sister was my best friend, or we came to be best friends. And in the midst of that marriage, when my ex-husband saw how close I was becoming with his family, at one point, he admitted to me that he told them vicious, awful lies about me to make Mm -hmm. them hate me. And they completely dissociated from me. And I said, why would you do that to me? You know I don't have family. And he said, because they loved you more than they loved me. Wow. And so he took that family. So I, I have had this, you know, part of my trauma in life has had this, is this feeling of not belonging and not having yeah, that's a big an deal. attachment to a family or to a per Like I felt very orphaned and alone most of my life. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh, oh God. That was, you just said so much about just the, the necessity and, and concept broadly of secure attachment. That's a huge yeah. deal. That's like, um, what am I talking about? The, like the stages of, of healthy child development. When we get to that point yes. of a, a, autonomy versus something that's not dependence with something else, but autonomy versus shame. I'm not sure. Uh, and, I'm, and that's the thing. Everybody put their shame, their yeah. unhealed trauma and their shame on me. I was the scapegoat for everybody else not yeah. to have to deal with their crap. But yep. now in this relationship with my husband, it's a very different dynamic. And it's the first time that I do. I He has seen me at my worst lows of low. He has been through some muck with me. And he won't abandon me like everybody else has abandoned me. Even yeah. people I thought would never abandon me have abandoned, but this man will not, he will not. And I know that. Yeah. And, and uh, you facilitate that this, and strengthen that connection by res- by the very act of respecting it in your mind and, and in behavior. Uh, that's, that's a huge deal. I mean, if you probably, if you treated him with, with, uh, you know, abuse and contempt, he would go, yeah, I tried. Sorry. See ya. Right. You know, you know, it's one of those things where you like, you can't just be a consistently awful person and, and rely on someone to be a saint and just let you get away with it. So that's, that's, that's right. good. That's part of forming a secure connection too. It's like, okay, we're going to, from a good place, from, from, from a desire to see our relationship improve, we're going to hold each other accountable in the nicest way possible, but 
but we're doing this, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's, right. That's exactly. Great. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And all of that, all of that lying on a leash, one image, <clears throat> all of that conversation. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? That's fantastic. I, know, I but love this it. This is what I love. And I'm so glad yes. we're having this, you know, bounce back because I would have never put that all together by myself with Google. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, we try, we do our best, but sometimes, sometimes you need a wizard. Sometimes you don't. Yeah, we do. We need you. And we never got, um, I was going to start with the idea of, you know, the first thing pops into my head with a plane is generally travel. You know, you're getting in a car, you're getting on a plane, you're going for a walk. There's this movement towards a destination, a goal. Um, I just wanted to throw that kind of broad top, uh, superficial level theories at you or associations at you and see where, where your mind goes with the idea of why are you getting on a plane? What does what does a plane mean to you in terms of in terms of that? Okay, there's a few things here. Um, so, at the end of my former marriage, one of the biggest things, like basically the night that I decided that I'm done, I I can't do this anymore. I'm cutting this guy loose. I just can't take another day being married to him because Lord knows I tried. Mm. I had this very, I had an epiphany basically. And all I had done, I was laying down in my basement. I slept on the couch in the basement and I said, what do I want? Because it's not this, this isn't even my life. This is the life he decided I was going to have, but it's not, it's not resonate. I feel dead inside. What do I want? And I wanted three things. I had always wanted to write because I had gone to DePaul University. I got a degree in journalism. I minored in psychology. I always wanted to write, but I didn't write because he didn't want me to do anything that, God forbid, would make me feel any sense of joy or achievement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Second thing I wanted, I I knew I wanted to be married. Of course, we all want our person. We all want that person to go to dinner with and at the end of the day, our best friend to share life with and go... I just didn't want to be married to him. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be married to somebody that appreciated me for who I am, didn't try to change me or bind me to rules and and restricted me. And I just wanted to be married in in a really healthy, loving relationship. Simple. I didn't ask for much. Mm -hmm. The third thing was I wanted to travel. And I, I had traveled a lot as a kid and in high school, That's the only thing from my childhood that I can honestly say I appreciate is that, you know, being having a narcissistic stepfather, we had to do very, you know, exciting things because he had to have stuff to brag about. Mm. So we did travel a lot. And I missed that because my ex-husband could he he the the last thing he wanted to do was go anywhere. Mm. I had taken my son, our son on a few vacations, but you know, I, it wasn't anywhere near what I wanted to do. So even when I, with my new husband in our first year together, we went on nine trips all over the world. Wow. We went on five last year. This year is going to be slow because I'm trying to publish two books and I need the time and the, the resources to do that. But Travel is a big thing for me. So that's part of the plane. Yeah. And I know that travel is not going to be in our near future as much, but it it will pick up once. I just want to focus right now on these next two books that I have to release that I'm working on. So the other part of this plane thing is sort of, you know, I feel that this year or in the, even in the last like handful of months, I have taken off, so to speak. I mean, that Mm -hmm. is a term in my brain that I would use because when I, so my first book, Gasping for Air, that is currently out that we published last year, that actually was a compilation of stories from my pre-marriage from a journal that I kept a record of what was happening because Mm -hmm. he was gaslighting me. Things were, he, there, there was a lot of fear that he was, because he did actually admit twice that he wanted to kill me. He was planning to kill me. I was afraid during COVID being stuck in the house, he was going to do something, make it look like an accident and nobody would know. So I kept this journal and I kept it under that couch in the basement that I slept on. So, I released the book last year and it's very exciting to release a book and I'm not diminishing that in any way, but I kept telling people 
this isn't so much about the book. It's about the greater impact it's going to have. I I always wanted to be a public speaker of some sort. Um, I never envisioned being on podcasts necessarily, but podcasts are a newer thing. Um, but I have been on so many podcasts that now I'm 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 going to be speaking in my second summit this week, and I'm going to be speaking in another summit this summer. Um, the idea of a TED Talk has been promoted. Um, Sweet. You know, so that might be in the works. And so I feel like, again, like things are taking off in the direction that I want them to. However, when I had this dream, was it the night before last? I've been for the last week, like mentally blocked, like writer's block mm. to a crazy level. My second and third books that are coming out this year are already written. But we're in the revision stage. You know, the publisher reads it over, sends me some notes back. Oh, the, these chapters really don't progress the story. What about this in this chapter? Now you got to rewrite that. So we kind of took a new direction with one of the books while she's reading the other one. And I've been trying to figure it out. And, and I, I was just so blocked. So I, I feel like somehow to me that played into like, we took off, but then we came right back. Like mm. we're we're trying to get this yeah. off the ground, maybe, but it's not. <laughs> yeah, that's a great. <laughs> we tried. That's and a great came spontaneous back. connection. Yeah, and, and yeah. I don't know if you um, remember what the did the pilot give any reason for coming back? No. I can't remember. Okay. No. Fair, fair enough. Oh no, I'm sorry. <clears throat> he just said they were having some technical difficulties with the plane. That's okay. all that was said. It's kind of the phrasing. Whatever. So I don't know. Kind of, yeah. Kind of so vague, I have no idea. Yeah. But I was fine with that because who wants to be on a plane that might go down? Nobody wants to crash. Let's just get on the ground safely and we'll, we'll figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. First. Yes. Safety exactly. First on that. On that. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's a great connection you put in there of like um, the takeoff and the return. Something's not something's not working the way it should. Um, right. But, but also. So it makes a tremendous amount of sense the idea that travel itself is important to you so i would imagine you've been on a fair number of planes i've been on a lot of planes yeah yeah and then um the idea of envisioning what it's like on a plane and envisioning maybe even the ideal circumstance not only first class but like a living room first class wide open space like very extremely comfortable it was very wide yeah, yeah. So i mean and even the seats were not quite recliners but like recliner like <laughs> yeah 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 here they, i'm they, an they author would and i can't even they would definitely the recline more than uh more than uh you know a, yeah a, i mean a, it was comfortable business class. it was yeah. very spacious and comfortable yeah here we have another guest she's gonna sit right on the notes of course Aww, this baby girl of course <laughs> <laughs> um so part of that could be aspirational of like success to you means I get to travel in, in the extreme comfort of first class. And not only that, the best possible first class. So part of that, another part of it might be, um, definitional. What am I saying? So there's aspirational success. And the other side was, um, damn, no, I had a second thought. It's gone. The cat. No, I know uh, what you mean because yeah. you're, I was dressed to the nines too. That and too, like I yes. told you, that's not normal for me. I mean, I, I do when I have to go somewhere that, that, you know, that requires that. But normally, I mean, literally like good, you're lucky if you can get me out of my like pajama pants. Like I'm usually oh, yeah. just leggings and a t-shirt, very casual. Mm -hmm. I, just not, I, I don't walk around with blouses and skirts and high heels and nylons. And even my hair, I remember, you could see this crazy curly hair. <laughs> it was like all pinned up all like in a French twist, like all fancy schmancy and pearls. Yeah. And like me and my lion were looking good. Yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> and he had the, you know, the diamond studded collar. Yes. Or whatever. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and for you, so there's, <laughs> it's going to fall on the dog. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Um, there's very much a, what is it? What comes to my mind is the idea of self-representation, public image in a way is like, so if there's the, and I'm glad you mentioned Ted talk and, and the idea of, of successful public speaking uh, or having success at it to the point where you might draw significant, a significant audience, so to speak. Um, yeah. and, and we all think about like, okay, well, how am I going to be perceived and we would uh i would 
make sure to put on pants before I left the house. So I mean, bare minimum. And then some people yes. are like, okay, I, this, <laughs> this event, this level of success, this level of prestige, respect, deter, uh, demands a little more effort from me to, to make myself presentable. And so for you, you're like, well, if I'm going to get dressed up, I'm going all the way. Uh, you know, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to do my utmost best to put on the best possible exterior for, for people to approve of in a way, but, but it's not just approval. I mean, we, we all look for that again. These are all new neutral terms in terms of like, it isn't uh, a lot of people right. go, Oh, you just want attention. It's like mother, we all want attention. Who doesn't want to be seen and respected and appreciated, right. you know? So these things are not derogatory. They get, they get, as you were saying about like triggers, they, these words get overused and they're not the, they're not even applying the principle correctly to half of this stuff. What they mean is, I, I think you're annoying when you say that. I don't like the way you say that. Or I don't like your face. And it's like, you trigger me. Like, get over it. That's that's not a trigger. <laughs> anyway. So I'll um, speak go ahead. to that for a second. And sure, this sure. might help you. So you, you touched on something that presented in my life twice that really affected me. Mm. I actually wrote about this in one of the books that will be coming out about my childhood. So my mother... When she got married to this man who was abusing me, he lived in, we, we, we were in Chicago. Mm. My mom's family's Puerto Rican, you know, I mean, you know, thus the curly hair and and all that. Mm. But I mean, I rolled my R's like my grandma and great grandma when they talked English, you know, you know, everything was (laughs) rolling and whatever. And my mother, when we moved to the suburbs with this man, you know, this is a predominantly Caucasian area, middle class. Like she, my mother has always been concerned about appearance. And I think mm. I was like, oh, her nemesis in that way, because even my husband now calls me his ragamuffin. I've always <laughs> been the ragamuffin. I wear these worn out cons, you know, Converse shoes with holes in them. And some of my leggings have holes in them. And because I just wear them to death. I mean, I, I love the That's worn. <laughs> I just like being comfortable. And I'm yeah. who I am. And, you know, like you, the hair. But see, this hair has been a thing. So my mother would straighten it on an ironing board oh, because, shit. and she would tell me to stop rolling my R's and she would take me to the gap and put me in ivory jeans and pink pastel polo shirts. And like, that's not who I am anyway, mm. but she was trying to make us appear a certain way, right? To fit in. Yeah. And I never fit in. I was even in school just you know, connecting with kids, you know, there's the nerds, there's the jocks, there's, you know, all the groups. I never fit into any of them because I was just like, even like you were asking, we were talking before we came on this recording and I'm like, I'm just me. I'm yeah. just me. I, I don't know who else to be. You always get but the real I deal. cried myself in that because I was always trying to, people are always trying to mold me into something else. Now, where I'm going with this, so then I'm at DePaul University. I'm in college. I'm in the journalism program. We're, you know, part of that program. We're taking courses where I'm in a booth, you know, very much set up like you are over there with the microphone and everything in the sound Mm -hmm. booth. And they're having me say the same two or three sentences over and over, correcting intonation and emphasis and all this stuff. But then they put you in front of the camera and <laughs> and they would tell me that my hair, I needed to straighten my hair out or at least smooth out the curls because this appeared too wild or too young or too. And there was all this. I, I just felt like the judgment. Yeah. I'm like, why can't? I mean, honestly, my hair does look fabulous when it's like curled a little softer and nice and done right it it looks a little better but this is this is me this is who I am and why like for me it was like here's my mother again somebody telling me like I I shouldn't look that way if you want to do this you have to look this way so for me that's just uh it's yeah. just it, it gnaws at the core of who I am because I I don't understand why there's so much judgment and ideas about perception in this world and why people aren't allowed to just be who they Mm -hmm. are instead of having to conform to this 
I don't even know whose idea of how we are supposed to be and how yeah. we're supposed to look. For so sure. go with that. Yeah, not all. <laughs> that's that's all really great stuff. Basically, uh, I ramble just long enough for someone to have better ideas and and say them. That's so that's, interrupt <laughs> any interrupt any time. Yeah, yeah. Because as as I said before, none of this is in my head. I have ideas about what you're sharing, and I try and reflect that back and clarify and and new perspectives and whatnot. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it's like you will have and every you the royal we will have the, your own connections and it's like a it's like an explosion in your mind it's like suddenly the light bulb turns on and you're like oh my yeah. god this this is is related this is meaningful um so in the context of it, just to clarify you you didn't know the destination of the plane you weren't going anywhere specific no. as far as you were aware okay so that because that would modify it maybe if you're like well yeah, i know I for sure no I, yeah i know for sure there was, I was no going to... luggage i didn't even see anyone else's luggage i didn't have luggage it was just me with this lion yeah. on a leash yeah. and like i said i'm dr like my hair i remember it was in a french twist i had pearls I wish I could remember what color blouse I had on because I know, but it was definitely like a long sleeved, very silky kind of material, shiny, satiny, whatever blouse mm -hmm. and a fitted, you know, pencil skirt. And I had heels like, you know, very <laughs> proper. And, and that, 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 that's interesting, too. And I'm glad you mentioned that. OK, so before I, before I forget, um, just the, the broad concepts of you're going somewhere you're traveling and the only things you brought you said you said no luggage the only things you brought you with you are literally your personal power and your public image and this is what you got you got yourself dressed oh yeah yeah that's right bam yeah because uh, i there's something honestly there. <laughs> i didn't even have a purse nothing i didn't have keys in my i mean i yeah. it was just me and this lion and and then uh, uh to just kind of loop, loop back a minute about what you said about the um you had a you gave a lot of detail about just how much effort you could or would put into this appearance down to the style of the skirt and the blouse and the pearls. And it's not just my hair was up. I don't know what kind of up French twist specifically. Mm -hmm. So you've, you've picked the, now I don't know that each one of those things is individually relevant or says something about, Yeah, you. I don't think so. Yeah, no, but just the but idea it definitely, that it's so I wanted to create detailed. the idea that it was, it, it was conservative, but stylish. But I mean, definitely like I, I, I looked Let's just say, you know, you can call it successful, wealthy. I, I'm not sure, but it definitely exuded it, and it's not who I am at all. Yeah. I mean, you want to talk about narcissism on a high <laughs> level and that is just not who I am. Well, that's that's interesting, too. And here's, you know, while you were describing that, I, I had a thought of like, it would be an amazing experience for you to go to a TED Talk in a t-shirt and sweats and sneakers and don't do your hair. I can't recommend that. Cause what would I do? I would probably put on nice pants and a deep. Can nice I shirt. tell you though? What's go ahead. I thought about it. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I thought about just going like with my cons and my leggings and a sweatshirt. And you know what? If the opportunity presented itself, I might because that's what I'm trying to let people know, whether it's on a mental health, you're an abuse victim trying to heal level, or just on a, you're a human being in this world, just like everybody else. We have to be ourselves. Why can't we be embraced for who we are? I, Why it, do I have to look a certain way for people to find me credible or to yeah. take heed of what my words are? Well, I've actually had people say uh, to me that I should put a little more production value into the show. Like right now, there's there's two of us on screen. You'll, you'll see it when you watch the video. I'm over here. You're over there. There's no camera switching. There's no editing for anything but at the request of the uh you know if we take a break i'll cut that out <laughs> no one wants to watch an empty chair for 10 minutes unless they're watching some twitch streamer um right but you know so i there's a lot of things i do not do it's so i think someone at one point told me i don't know where this came from they're like you know you should wear a suit and a tie and i'm like 
I don't think I've ever worn a suit and a tie in my life. I mean, I went to a wedding once when I was like six or something. I probably I think it was a ring bearer at my aunt's wedding or something, something like that. Um, but you know, that, that's not me at all. This is, you know, you get my, no. I'm, you know, so I, I, I and keep I it authentic how, too. But see somebody, yeah. And somebody like me who like is all of, I mean, that's like, I hate to call it a gimmick, but like my brand or whatever, what, I love authenticity. I literally like when you came on the screen, I was like, amen. Like oh. this, <laughs> I love that you're relaxed and you're comfortable and your cat has been extremely comfortable laying there this whole time. And your so other cats are just walking around. <laughs> yeah. But you know what the, you know, you got the one animal on your, I love this because this is just life. And this is what I do. But this you're is me. brilliant. And, oh. and, and, People need to start valuing the things about us that are inside of us that they can't see instead of trying so hard to judge from, you know, from what they do see, because what you see isn't always what you get. One of one of the wealthiest people, I mean, certainly not the wealthiest in the world, but one of the wealthiest people I ever met looked like some scum of the earth. He he didn't even try. He wore jeans, I think, that were probably 20 years old and a jean jacket that was equally yeah. old. And, and he didn't try. He had Marlboro, Marlboro's, I can't even say it, in the pocket <laughs> all the time and took out a smoke like anyone else. Yeah. But he was extremely wealthy. He owned several airplanes. He owned several properties. Yeah. He had a lot of wives, too, that got a lot of alimony. But he just looked like plain old regular guy Joe from, like, you know, some rough part of town. Yeah. Why do we judge? There is a, there is a wonderful bell curve and it's for good or ill yin yang again. Hello. <laughs> um, there's so, so on one end is people who are like, they kind of have nothing and they dress like it and that's just what it is. And they don't give a fuck either. And then there's all the rest of us kind of in the middle that are like, well, I kind of have, I have enough. I can make an effort. Should I, how much of an effort should I make? And, and that goes all the way up to, uh, you know, at the, at the peak of it, we might say is people who are like, I must every day dress to the nines. I must follow the, the, the latest fashions. I must always be on the cutting edge. I, I must be mm -hmm. a trend setter, all that just obsession. And then you start getting into, into some of the other folks that are, that are just extremely wealthy and they got, I mean, I dream of fuck you money. I'll walk around. I'll walk around <laughs> naked. I don't give a shit. <laughs> That's, I mean, I want, that would be fit. No, I'm not doing anything to actively pursue that. Like, whatever. I'm good. No, I'm, but I know what you, but mean. I love it. I, love I know it. what you mean. Yeah. People who are like, I got nothing to lose by being completely authentic. And, and then it's also kind of how, you know, who your real friends are too. Like you were saying, the boundary issue of things like yeah. if you always get the real me and you don't like it, that's fine. No hard feelings. Sayonara, you know? Uh, but if you do, I know you're not, you're not falling in love with it, with a facade that, that I have to worry about maintaining. I, just, I can't, right. I can't, I can't be asked to do it, you know, on that side of things. And, and I'm, I don't think I'm functionally capable of just, of being exactly. dis disingenuous at all times. Oh God, that's a, talk about mental bandwidth. That's, I don't know how people, I don't know how people do that. I, I just, I can't imagine. Mm -hmm. Um, no. So, okay. So all of this is with the, um, okay. I did want to mention, uh, if you decided to do it, you could probably make it part of the talk of like, Hey, look at me. You don't get a lot of people in sweatpants up here. Most people dress up. Let me tell you why I didn't and why that's a good thing. And you, you could open that way. Oh, just I to, love it. You're you, giving me my introduction. If you, if you, <laughs> if you choose to go that route, I, and again, I'm not going to, I'm not going to put, I course, think I would honestly, because what am I trying to do? Impressing people. They need to listen to me. You know, it's in my former marriage. I used to try, I tried so hard with him to see if I could change him or influence him. And I used to tell him, pretend I'm blind and pretend I'm deaf. Although sometimes I can't be deaf. But I said, <laughs> I want you, because it, it goes to this action, speak louder than words kind of a thing. I said, I don't feel like you say you love me, mm -hmm. but I don't feel it or see it in your actions towards me. So I'm like, if I was blind... How would you love me? How would you show me you love me? If I was deaf, so for me, it's kind of like that same thing. Like, what does it matter if I'm up there in leggings and cons, you know, maybe even with my curly, crazy hair, like just listen to my words. That's, that's where the value is.
Mm. You know, I'm not here to be your eye candy. See, I'm already starting my TED Talk. I'm not <laughs> here to be your eye candy. I'm here for you to get something out of what I have to say, which is a result of my experience, you know? So yeah. you can even thank tell, you. you. Now can, we've worked out. I'm so excited. <laughs> now I'm ready for my TED Talk. We, we can, you can even <laughs> tell people, don't look at me at all. It's not, it doesn't matter. Close your eyes. Listen, listen to what I have to say. Uh, that, that might be interesting too. Now, the one, the one caveat I would give to that is make sure no one else has already done this before. You can probably only get away with it once. Otherwise they'll be able to say, they'll be like, Oh, someone's already done this now. That, so it wouldn't be as impactful or original. Um, so you might want to wa yeah, watch a few, enough. <laughs> just watch a few, <laughs> just in, just in case. I don't know. Uh, but that would be fantastic if we, uh, you know, between the two of us came up with an idea that honestly, no one's had the guts to do. I'm, I'm sure people have <laughs> thought about it. What if I just went in sweatpants? Oh no, I can't. See, I look at us with our cats <laughs> laying around and our curly hair coming up with brilliant ideas. I, people judge. I, I never do this too. I mean, people, people see this and I, I don't know if they realize just how much of this there is it's just crazy. you have a lot of curly hair oh you have it, yeah I don't know. it's nuts it's nutsy <laughs> and i only grew this out. okay so there is a little bit of the appearance going on here um what is a what is a wizard well it's typically a little bit older a little gray in the beard has a beard kind of longer hair i'm a gandalf weed so there is there are aspects to it where i'm like i grew out my hair a little bit because wizards have long hair and 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 a beard and so there's, there's definitely, and it's also like the, on the t-shirt here, it's the branding. I, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I see that. I don't, I don't have the hat, you know? So maybe one we'll of these days, one. maybe one of these days <laughs> I'll get a hat. Yeah. I want to, maybe I should buy one of those sorting hats. That Those are fun. But then I'd have to, I'd have to change the dynamic of my, yeah, you I'd would give myself to a little, fit it all in there. Well, what I do is I, and this is, you know, shop talk or whatever. I have the camera angled down so people can see me writing and, and taking notes. Cause when I'm right. just like talking to myself while in this dead air uh yeah then you me, look weird yeah 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 just me taking notes so you know and of course no if you get to the moment and you're like you know i feel like and, and there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with this either way you can go i'm doing this for a reason i'm doing this because i don't give a fuck or you can say i genuinely feel like this experience deserves a certain level of effort from me to be commensurate with the experience itself and that's fine it's like we don't go to a wedding in sweatpants we, we try to respect the event right. more than that so right. i think either either choice is perfectly fine you know uh, but this one is and that's the thing about the dreams too so you show yourself this image of yourself in the dream we can look at it from a lot of different angles of like you are theoretically exploring what if i put this level of effort in what would that feel or what would that experience be like rather than saying um, oh, I necessarily must believe this is the appropriate course of action because look, I showed it to myself. So sometimes we, we play around with ideas. A lot of dreams are, are, are what ifs, what if scenarios, are thought experiments. Um, we put ourselves in a yeah. scenario to, to look at it for the purpose of thinking it through. Uh, now, some dreams are definitely, this is what I want, wish fulfillment. Some dreams are, this is what I'm, I'm afraid of. Uh, uh, here's, here's, you know, trauma from my past that, that has been, brought back to my mind because I was in a recent experience that made me feel threatened in a specific way. Um, but that's, that's a lot of, a lot of dreams as well. It, you look like you had a thought and I, uh, yeah, go ahead. I, I am. I I'm thinking and listening to you. You're very <laughs> perceptive. No, as you're saying all that, I'm wondering, see, I'm trying to put it all together in my head. Sure. For some reason, I felt like the, the peanut M&Ms, when she asked me yeah. what I wanted, I'm in this, I mean, let's call it first class to the extreme. I didn't order caviar. I've had caviar, though. It's gross. <laughs> I didn't order caviar or shrimp cocktail or I wanted peanut M&Ms. And I'm wondering now if, because that's literally like my favorite candy. Like I, yeah. And I don't have them very often. And that's the thing. But maybe i maybe part of me in this you know this whole pretense that i was putting out felt like i needed something that was true to me something i mean talk about that authenticity sure. yeah. like maybe those peanut m&ms were dana and her leggings and and cons and her sweatshirt that just wanted to be who i am and didn't want to put this whole thing on i just wanted a part of me back if that makes any sense sure i don't know no, yeah no and, it's, and i think it's fantastic that that angle on it was 
inspired, but just, just randomly. Just yeah, by what you were saying. Yeah, your own, I was your listening own... to you and I'm thinking peanut M&Ms and like that's... Yeah, we hadn't even gotten there yet. <laughs> a very casual... Yeah, but it's so casual compared to... I mean, you don't... The way I was dressed and present... I mean, I should have been in some Parisian restaurant somewhere or something ordering something fancy. Yeah. And I just wanted some peanut m and For sure. Yeah, and there's... um. Two, two things about that. There's uh, the sequence of boarding the plane. And then there's what I call like a hard cut. Uh, and I put a little Delta next to it. Oh, it's a funny Delta Airlines. But uh, we're not mentioning any specific airlines. Um, no. Right. But I put a Delta as in change, scene change. And it's like I'm boarding the plane. I'm at the bar. The plane is landing because we have technical difficulties. Um, and yeah. it's actually in the bar scene. It's at the, you know, the bar on the plane, food, food station, whatever it is. Um, yeah. it, it brought to my mind the idea of, um, you know, the, um, what was it? The cafe cars on a train in a way where there's like, yeah. there's room to walk and there's some chairs and then there's the little counter and there's someone there and they may serve cocktails and they may make you, uh, you know, scrambled eggs or whatever they do. Um, but at this particular thing, it was, it was during this sequence that the, you discovered, the, the announcement was made about the technical difficulties. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't discovered before you boarded. That would have been a different experience. Oh, and it wasn't after. It, it, yes. Yeah, so no, cause something... I never sat back down. I walked to this. I mean, I call it a bar because it was an L shaped like wooden counter yeah. behind which this flight attendant, so to speak, bartender, but there was nothing. I mean, it was plain. There was no, there were no bottles. There was no food displayed. I, how did I even know they had peanut M and M's? I had no idea. There yeah. was nothing. It was bare. And you did ask. There was nothing. You did ask for. And it. You I just specifically it. asked for. And, I just. And like, they had it. And wanted. do you remember receiving them and eating them? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. And at the yellow package, I love peanut <laughs> M and M's. I tore it open and popped you... a few in my mouth. And that's when the pilot came on and said, we're going back because of technical difficulties. Do you, do you ever put them in the freezer? I don't. I'm not a f- candy freezer person. Fair, fair enough. Fair enough. I was going to say, and I, I, I like love the way they, too much. I love the way they crunch and the, and the, and the chocolate's hard and it, it does a little something to the peanut. Like I think frozen peanuts aren't as good. So I don't know. Change, yeah, it very much changes the texture. My husband's into frozen. Yeah, he <laughs> frozen freezes. Candies. I was gonna say he freezes his nuts, but yeah, you know. <laughs> In this uh, weather, his nuts probably are frozen right now. <laughs> right for sure. Um, yes. Yeah, so, okay. So there's. Uh, you mentioned it as authenticity to yourself, and I, that's what I was mentioning. Um, the idea of that's fantastic. You came to that on your own, and uh, it's not something. It's. I'd say it's more important that that association was volunteered than I had to suggest it. And you go. Is it? I don't know. I don't want to put ideas in people's head as much as possible. Um, that said, the alternative perspective that I was considering is the idea of you've, you've mentioned it as your favorite treat in a way that you don't yeah. have very often. And that and, and sometimes we use those as rewards for accomplishing goals like if i get this done I'll, I'll reward myself i'll get i'll get my favorite treat so there's something there's there's a comfort food aspect to it as well so you know favorite yes. favorite treat reward comfort food authentic all of that kind of blends together in this thing so you're in this experience and you're like if, if we're conceptualizing it as bringing um traveling i felt out of place ahead. is what i'm gathering because you everything did. you said, I definitely felt that those M&Ms were some, because I thought immediately when I woke up that, you know, and had, had the that comfort food and indulgence, mm-hmm. but it's something that's very casual and common and not seeming to be like they should, I mean, they shouldn't have even had them. I would have expected them <laughs> to have more you know, Fancy upgraded stuff. or yeah. yeah, exactly. Or at least in the, so maybe it was, yeah, I just felt like there was some need for me to find something more true to me or some return to, to yeah. just my casualness and my, who I am. I don't know. Yeah, no, exactly. That's, that's shades. It's like, it's like, it's like, maybe uh, I was uncomfortable in the state, I, I call it a state. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. uncomfortable being so dressed up and putting out this. I always call it a pretense because it's a facade, but. Yeah. 
that's I wrestle with that too. The idea of like, you yeah. know, if it's not, if I'm putting on a display that for the sake of approval, how, how do I, how do I balance that with the proper idea of authenticity? Um, you know, cause, hmm. and then there's different, and I, a lot of it I put is, you know, contextually is like, uh, um, I put on pants before leaving the house, even if I don't wear them at home, but that kind of a thing It's like, sometimes you yeah. do, do this for others as a little nod, but you know, that doesn't mean I'm going to buy the most expensive designer pants I can afford. Right. I don't go that far. I don't, I don't do everything I possibly could. Um, okay. Long story short on that one, <clears throat> a couple of things came to mind of the, you said, you know, comfort food indulgence. Uh, but the, what came to my mind was simple, simple pleasure, a simple pleasure, something that's not, yeah. I mean, you could have, what am I trying to say? So I was conceptualizing this as well, building that kind of narrative arc type of thing. You're entering a plane with, with, as, as I phrased it earlier, like your, you know, your personal power and your, and your public image and you're traveling towards you're engaged in travel, which is typically movement towards a destination. You don't travel for nothing. You travel to get somewhere. So there's, there's a lot of metaphorical moving towards a goal in, in the act of, of, of travel. So you get on a plane to go somewhere that somewhere is the goal. And in the middle of the flight, you go to the bar and, and you to, to visualize yourself receiving something and it's something you want. And it's this very simple thing that you have at home that you don't have to go anywhere to get. It's the, it's the most basic thing that, that, that doesn't match, as you were saying, with the hoity-toity side of things. So what came to my mind was the idea of, of the reward for the journey. Like you're, you're, what am I trying to say? You're imagining, maybe, why am I doing this? What do I want out of this experience? And if, if we go with that idea of, you know, do I really want to get to the goal or would I be happy with a bowl of peanut M&Ms? You get the peanut M&Ms, you eat them, and the pilot comes on and says, ah, uh, technical difficulties, we've got to go back. And it, that sequence of events, and, and then you're back on the ground. It's like the, the uh, you showed the journey, the entire journey being canceled uh, because something was not working cor mm -hmm. correctly. So I think there's something, I, I think there's something going in there about like you evaluating what do I want out of this experience? What, what, what's the reward I'm aiming towards or the, the accomplishment in some ways. And you're like, you know, how accomplished do I need to be? I'd be happy with a bowl of peanut M&Ms. I mean, what's, what, what do I really want? And that could I'm, I'm going well to stop be. there. I'm going to stop no, there. No, that yeah. could very well be. So thoughts going through my head. Yeah. Um, I'll go backwards. Just what you just said now that I'd be happy with a bowl of M&Ms. I have had a lot of people just, personally i know they're rooting for me and i know they mean well but they're like oh hope you're making money on this hope you're you know they people equate success and money and i i am repeatedly defending that number one i will never see the amount of money you know come back to me that i have put into this you know project of publishing books and, and websites and, and all this stuff that i'm doing but the 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 goal has always been to just help people and i knew that going into it and yeah. i think that's why i'm like you know even when i got my first royalty check it was like oh how much was it how much was it i don't even know it was like 25 bucks i i don't even know but it was like i don't know why people think like they have this expectation and i never had it because i know how this stuff works and i never did it for that mm -hmm. I just did it because I wanted to save other people and to make them more aware and, and to also just be an example. Like you can go through crap. We all go through crap, but you can be okay. You can laugh. You can still enjoy life. You can still get married and have a healthy relationship. You can still live your damn life. You don't have to live in your victimhood and cry the rest of your life and then die and that's it. So then the other part of that that I'm wondering that that's just speaking to the I'm happy with the M and M's because I I would love I am very happy with just plain old M and M's. You're, you're probably or, gonna well, go buy some today. Be, you know, <laughs> You've been talking about yeah, it. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> no, it's too icy out there. Otherwise, oh, yeah, I would. Yeah. But, <laughs> but now I'm wondering if the takeoff and the return and the M and M, like I'm wondering if all this was maybe a return to 
exactly who I am. Like I, I was right back to where I started because one of the things that I joke about almost every day is I'm Dana in real life, but then like I, I joke when I put on it, you know, for a lot of speaking engagements, like the stump, the summit that I'm doing later this week, I will have my hair done and I will put on a blouse and I will have my makeup And I always joke with my husband, okay, well, now I'm going to go be other Dana because Mm -hmm. it's like my, I call it my alternate personality, you know, and, or, you know, my alter ego. So I sometimes feel that that's inauthentic in itself, that there's like two Danas. There's date, like you're seeing Dana, Dana, like this is just who I am every day. I've been writing all morning and then I'm podcasting with you and then I'm going to go write again the rest of the night and make some hot cocoa and eat some <laughs> probably garbage because I can't today. I worked and then, out really and then good at this the end morning. you say today was a good day. <laughs> and then at the end I say today was a good day because honestly today it has been a really good day. Mm-hmm. I haven't had to deal with, you know, all the other stuff or yeah. worry about, you know, like I'm glad like what, the first time you cussed on this. I mean, it's not like we're throwing <laughs> them out there left and right, but we're just being you and me. Whereas sometimes like when I speak in the summit, I got to I, I can't, I can't let a word like that slip, which is fine. I know how to turn it off. But again, we're going into here's my alter ego that I joke about all the time. And I and then yet I'm trying to just hold on to who I am because I feel like that's like the sellout version. Like that's the yeah. version of me that, you know, even on I hate to say people, if you do go to follow me on Facebook or Instagram, I mean, that's fine. And and it's me you're engaging with. But like even my friends in real life are like your your professional pictures on. So they don't even look like you like they're <laughs> me, but they're not me. Yeah. And here. Well, I'm just now thinking of another aspect of this. Yeah. I remember the last, like, you know, we get reviews as podcasters or or for interviews I do on the radio, people might comment or on social media. And I remember not that long ago, maybe in the last week or two, reading to my husband, we were laying down to go to bed at night, but I I always have my laptop with me. And I'm like reading him some, you know, oh, she's amazing and resilient and brilliant and all this stuff. And I, I remember looking at him and saying, who's the are they talking about <laughs> that's not like they hadn't seen me cry like a goddamn baby on christmas eve because you know of this mo- mother wound that i have that you know yeah i'm healed and i'm good but let me tell you sometimes you you go backwards a few steps before you have to stand back up and wipe off the dirt and, and keep going forward but i'm like who are they ta- like it does i remember saying to this specifically i feel like people even though i'm trying to present this authentic thing and whatever like sometimes i think like they're creating this version of me that yeah. i don't even see myself as for sure no that's a big and problem it's weird too. there's very much a curated best parts version of ourselves that a lot of us put out in public and that happens yeah in, i mean and that's actually like an uh a, a, well, an ancient pattern but we, we even go back to like say the uh the stereotypical perfect looking family but then they got some dark secrets and that's i mean that's a trope that's a whole oh yeah theme of things you know that's and that's you probably you, well you live through that <laughs> yeah public persona yeah. everything's fine but Literally. in the house yeah 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 for sure so there's um, and probably you know it's interesting too because you and i ended up in a lot of the same places in terms of our thinking about some things yeah even though my experience was very much different from yours i uh, love both my parents they were always good to me i was a little shit and caused endless problems for them <laughs> they never worried about whether i was gonna find my own way <laughs> but uh, you know the but uh you know so apologies to my parents out there and thanks for n- never f- just literally murdering me for being an asshole <laughs> yeah uh, i was going somewhere with all that oh uh, the idea of um nope lost it again damn Persona. You were yes. saying because we came from different perspectives, different pasts, but we came to a lot of the same conclusions and ideas about these things. For sure. Yeah. And public, well, the idea of public persona, there's a, we, a lot of us put on different masks and they can be specific yes. to the role. I mean, if you're in the role of a, um, 
a surgeon, your, your job is to fix the heart. And so we, we constrain ourselves. Yeah. But the, but the problem with the, say the best parts version we put online is other people look at that and go, they compare it to the, the full knowledge of themselves. And like, I'm not that good. They're not that good either. They're, they're not as perfect as they look because we pick the best. Exactly. We don't pick the worst photograph of ourselves to put online. We pick the one we think is best. And we, exactly. tell, we tell the stories that we think make us look good. And it's, that's why I think, um, you know, I, I'm not, I can't handle most reality TV these days. And I was never really big into it, but the real world was interesting. Even that was a curated version, but it was not scripted. It wasn't drama. as produced as they are now. They are way overproduced now. Because I remember the very first season ever of the real world on yep, MTV. Some, some shit went down. Yeah. And actually now we're. Oh my God. <laughs> I remember yeah. that too. Uh, now there's a new show and I, I'm not watching it either. Cause I just, I can't, I can't handle my wife. Likes some of those uh, like bad girls club where they put, let's put the worst possible people. The in real the house. housewives and stuff. Let's put all the worst people in the house and watch them screaming at each other. I get yeah. viscerally angry. I feel leave the room i cannot yeah. watch that stuff well she yeah, has, makes good tea supposedly but yeah drama i guess but uh um e- even that is you know poked and prodded and escalated and and selectively oh yeah all, all that all that good stuff but anyway my wife doesn't watch that stuff anymore we turn off the cable we, now we just like youtube and read books and listen to music um it's going somewhere with that too oh yeah so we get this keep it up with the joneses type of thing where it's like you know everyone's trying to put their best foot forward and then we're all trying to meet each other's fantasy expectations of themselves it, it in a way of you know, compare comparison to, well, they're gonna and it's not just one upping in a uh, i'm gonna do better than you because because to make myself feel like i'm better than you but also to 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 if someone's that good i need to try a little harder or i need to make my public persona a little bit better to keep that keep that image up so I was going yeah, say, I was and going that's the with weird that. thing. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm with you on this path because I think I'm figuring this all out now, and I think we're right on all accounts. But you know what it brought to my mind was when my book was about to be released last year, and I had this professional photography done that the p- publisher said I should have, and which picture are we going to put in the book and which picture? And there were, I think like 180 photos professional. I had professional hair and makeup and photos. And mm. I said, I hate all of them. I hate every <laughs> damn one of them. My husband looked them all over. He's like, they're, you're gorgeous. Like I need to have some of these blown up. My publisher was like, are you crazy? Like you look beautiful. And you, I said, but none of them look like me. I don't feel like that's me. I'm looking at them. And I said, there is one out of all of those pictures that to me, when I look at it, I'm like, that's, that's who I am. And I sent it to her. And honestly, it was a photo, ironically, that in the midst of this photography session at this professional studio, which cost a freaking fortune, (laughs) I stopped the photographer. I stopped her direction and everything. I said, okay, just stop. I said, I want you to turn your back to me. Put your camera, like, let it down, let it hang off your neck. I said, I I literally just was like, I when you turn around, I'm just going to look up at you, snap the picture. Mm. Because I'm just, I'm not even going to think. I'm just going to look up at you and snap the picture. She looked like I was a crazy woman, but she turned around. I sat on the floor, crisscross applesauce, very casual, slump shoulders. And when she turned around, I, I said, I'm going to count to three, one, two, three. And I said, I'm going to look up and you're going to turn around and just snap whatever it is. Don't pose me. Don't tell me. Just take the picture. And that was the picture that I told the publisher. I said, that is the only picture of all these 180 I like. And you know why? Because it captured me. And and you know what the ridiculous thing was? The photographer, right after she snapped it, she looked at the camera. She goes, oh, my God. I mean, she was just, like, stunned. But she, you know She what? said, that's good, huh? I wasn't. She, You know what she said? She goes, you look so sad. Ooh. And I did. It was a very sad expression, and I hadn't intended it, but mm. it was the most real. And, and she also commented, she's like, I can't believe you're sitting on the floor, Chris Crutch. Because she had me in these <laughs> fancy, high-backed, you know, velvet chairs and, you know, very ornate, so you know. Yeah. 
And I'm just sitting on the floor, crisscross applesauce, looking I, like I just cried my I just literally looked up at her with these sorrowful eyes, and I didn't even mean to, but that was, to me, the only picture. Is that picture anywhere publicly? No, oh, they didn't use no. that one, ma'am. No. Fair and enough. every day, almost, I, I am, because I'm in control of my social media, one of these days, sooner than later, I will release it and maybe even tell that story with it, because... All these other pictures are out there of me with this hair and this makeup. And it's just, you know, it's pretty, I guess. But, you know, it's not who I am. Yeah, definitely. And then. um, So I feel like that that's part of this, that that something is with this whole blouse and high heels and hair pinned up. And all of this discussion of that broader idea of what is your relationship to your own public image and how important is it that other people, uh, see you in a certain way. I, I actually, um, I I don't know, this might sound narcissistic, but I, I pity some people for the amount of effort they put into some things. And, and there's, there's, um, I don't know. Again, the, the reason I went with narcissistic on that side, I was like, well, I think my way is better and therefore they're doing it wrong. There's kind of, there's a bit of a self aggrandizement in judging other people's efforts. So I try to avoid that in a lot of ways, but I feel sorry for them in terms of like, you know, maybe that's what makes them happy and they're, and, and it's all genuine for them and they really want to live that way. But I'm like, you're so obsessed with something that I think is ultimately not that important, not as important as, the effort it, that's being put into it. And I, and I kind of, no, but you know why them. people do it. Mm. And I, I actually, it's funny because I just wrote about this in the revisions I'm doing mm. in the third book that will be coming out. And it was my reflections on a picture of somebody <laughs> real. So I'll leave who, who they are out. But I remember looking at the picture that was in a rustic setting, like it was outdoorsy and here's this outdoorsy guy and his outdoorsy sons, and there's the wife. And her hair was curly, but the curls were, like, too perfect. Even mm. her bangs, not one hair was out of place. They were as, like, and her nails were done, and I don't think she ever wore that camo vest or whatever, you know, in those jeans ever before. But she was trying to look like, like, and to me, when I remember, because I I wrote a whole page about this, that somebody that strives to look that perfect is hiding something, Mm. but there is a sense of control that they have to have in how they look to others because they want to control how they are perceived. And I have a big problem with that. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yet I'm doing it too because <laughs> here's all these stupid pictures of me. Yeah. And they're nice, I guess. I've gotten used to them, but I think we all struggle with Ugh. it. I think we do. You know, I, I try not to go out in public smelling bad because I don't want to offend anybody. You know, that that kind of a thing. I mean, there's there's levels to it. That's that's okay, maybe that's there are basic. Levels, maybe then, that's basic kindness. You know, <laughs> in certain countries that's actually not a problem. So, you yeah, know. Yeah. Absolutely. No, it, it's definitely cultural standards and uh <laughs> I wonder if there's, I wonder if there's anywhere on the earth, some tiny little town in some country somewhere where any one of us could go to me, for example, where like all the people there are perfectly accepting and, and, and good with all by idiosyncrasies and strange beliefs and uh, habits and whatnot, you know, nothing criminal, nothing hurting anyone. Just, you know, just me being weird and doing my own thing. Um, I'm thinking it's a nudist colony it might somewhere be, right? in like Florida or somewhere, you know, <laughs> where they're just free and everybody is Could just, be. you know, so, has that free spirit and non-judgmental. So. I just wonder, like, I think it would, I'm not even sure that place exists. I'm not sure. Yeah, that, I don't know. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is that, that's why I said, you know, just even the tiniest little hamlet in some backwater of some country we've never heard of where that's the one place and it may not, it may not exist. Just a little thought experiment. No, because every, even if you take, you know, let's think about Africa or like some indigenous people on an island somewhere, they still have standards that they hold their people to. And if you don't uphold them, exactly. 
So I, I don't think there's an escape from it. Yeah. Maybe that's, maybe, you know what? I, I'm just, maybe that's it. Maybe I feel like I need to escape. Maybe that was my attempt getting on that airplane to escape this sense, this alter ego and this idea that maybe I'm not presenting about who I really am, but then I return. I have peanut M&Ms and I return back to where I started yeah. to just being me. There was, and that's what we were trying to connect or I, I was earlier in, in saying yeah. that is the, that there's a process to that second act in a way. Cause the third act is like, uh, now you've arrived and there's a scene too. And I don't want, I wanted to touch on that too, before we forget it exists, but there's kind of a sure. pro process to that idea of, of receiving, you know, questioning what you want, receiving it, enjoying it, having it be fulfilling or, or, you know, r r reminding you of who you really are in that sense of like, what's, what's important to you or what's satisfying to you. And then immediately after that, having the technical difficulties announced that caused the plane to land. There's some, some connection in the, in the sequence of events there that says, you know, once you've identified some element of yourself, you, you realize why the process isn't working to take you where you need to go. And mm -hmm. so you're like, okay, let's go, let's just go down. Let's, let's stop traveling. Let's get safely onto the ground. And that's a place of, of reevaluation re or what is it? You, um, like it's essay writing, but it's also in the, um, um, uh, was it epilogue? epilogue of, of, of books and movies and stuff like that, where they kind of reflect back on what happened and give it some context or, well, okay, how do the characters yeah. feel about their experience? So I think that's kind of what's going on with the, with the landing. Um, you go back on the ground and you and the lion walk off the plane down a little set of stairs. I'll tell you what, I've been on two planes in my entire life. I don't travel either. Like I, if I could never had to leave my backyard, I'd be happy, happy man. <laughs> some, someday working on it. Um, yeah, that's my, actually that's my definition of success. I'm, I've, I can earn all the money I need without ever having to leave this, you know, three quarters, uh, three quarters of an acre. <laughs> I'm feeling you on that. <laughs> right. I, I understand. And you get off the plane and it's more like a parking lot, not actually like an airport, Tarmac. Yeah, it doesn't um, feel like I'm at an airport. I mean, there's nothing. I, I see some kind of maybe a two or three story building, very plain. Maybe it's like light brick or something, but mm. that's on the other side of the plane. And the plane doesn't even look like I, it's not a commercial jet, but it's not a, I don't even know if it, I didn't really make out the plane itself, but I remember just standing in this desolate airport. And again, there's a few people, but I, they're just in my peripheral vision. Nobody like actually stands out as being anybody or what no their purpose yeah. is. And no interaction with them. Yeah. That's why I didn't ask much about the people on the plane. No they're just interaction kinda, they're just at all. There. There's other people. They're just why there. Yeah. Yeah. So I get, I come down off and, and I go out, a, you know, a, a little distance and I'm just standing there with my lion and, and there's nothing else there except mm -hmm. me and these people standing there. Do, do you have the sense that it's the same place you left at the beginning? Yes. You do. Okay. Yes. So was, I do have the same sense. Yes. So there's, there's interesting things that can happen there of like, it could be the case that like if you had told it this way and that uh just as an example when i left it was very much an airport when i came back to the same place it was not an airport anymore is that where you're going with it or is it more like you never really noticed what it was before but you know it is the same place even if you never saw i didn't notice what it was before okay. but i definitely felt that it was the same place gotcha so you maybe so there's so if we're going with that epilogue or third third act kind of wrapping it all together like what's the result of this what's the i was thinking like essay style like you uh um you know you do an introduction body conclusion it's kind of conclusion in a way uh and not all dreams are like this some of them are a little more loosey-goosey but uh it's now that you've returned to where you started from that you're actually showing yourself having a look at the surroundings and that's when you realize it was it's not the typical kind of airport that it, that it right. is, is an airport, but it's not the typical kind or it's not an airport at all. Correct. It might not be an airport at all. Okay. But Interesting. There was nothing else but that building, which was very plain and there was nothing, no markings, no nothing. And just sky and this plane that i just oh yeah got it was all of. daylight yeah i forgot that too. and it was still all daylight yeah yeah and that may or may not well you did mention it 
so that's pro there's probably some relevance there um broadly speaking night and day night tends to be you know night shadows uh darkness it can right. be it can be a threatening time like the deep dark woods it can be a time right. of 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 con both concealment or revealed secrets uh can 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 come from night nighttime nighttime is a period of right. often right but i feel like the daylight is like i'm seeing something clearly i can see yes. everything clearly i'm yeah. back to where i started the full light, and light I'm of fine, day and i'm fine like feeling internally like I have to say, like, I wasn't feeling any worry for like, oh, is the plane going to be fixed? Am I going to be able to go on the trip? None of that was happening. Yeah, I, I was. I was honestly, I felt very indifferent. I was just there with my lion, like, okay, we're just going to wait here patiently. It and is what it is. Yeah. Yeah, that's one, exactly one, what I felt. Wonderful acceptance feeling. You, you, yeah. you reminded me of something. So I'm always trying to do this better. I, I, I haven't asked about any colors. You never volunteered. So, so sometimes I don't introduce a lot of stuff, but almost everyone has feelings in their dreams and you've volunteered a few, but I keep forgetting to ask that kind of stuff. And I'm, I'm glad every time you, 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 you and other guests have done so I I'm uh, pretty significantly on the um, Aspie side of the aut autism spectrum. I, uh, I, I've taken a test and I, I, uh, most people have a full range of emotional intensity that goes like zero okay. zero to 83 i'm at about an 11 so i have emotions they're there but they're very they're just just uh it's like when you sprinkle a little salt on versus you know yeah. chewing chew on a piece of beef jerky it's it's like a very different intensity level um okay so i don't think there's one way i'm trying to get better i don't think to ask people well, how are you feeling how'd you feel about that uh, so it's a great reminder so you at the very end of it there was no uh, okay i also wanted to ask in the beginning in the middle and at the end so in the beginning when you were aware that other people were on the plane and they were probably looking at you did you have any feelings about that or no you, and no i didn't emotions? even feel like anyone the only thing i felt and, and it was that was the only real prevalence of anything really on the plane was where's my husband is he gonna make the flight you know i was just concerned about yeah. where he was because he's always with me that's another thing I wanted to mention his we'll get come back around to his to his absence briefly. Um and then in the middle section with the um peanuts and the announcement of returning any in, any intensity of emotion there any, And that's the thing. I no no fear not no at fear all. that the plane was going to crash. That didn't even cross your no mind. No fear. Yeah, yeah. And really the only color that I remember in the whole I mean it wasn't a black and white dream but the only color that stood out to me was the yellow on the because i mean that that peanut m m package is a bright yellow you but did mention color, i remember right. holding yeah, yeah. it and, and noticing and i know yellow is a happy color and i actually hate the color yellow but i do love it on a package of peanut m m's because for they sure are good. that's that context right there like <laughs> uh probably i mean number one i'm not keyed to listen for emotional stuff as much as i should be working on it but also that kind of explains itself why yellow because that's the color of the peanut m, m package so it's self-explanatory yeah. one of those things we go let's really interrogate why that package had to be yellow no it's yellow because it's yellow it just is <laughs> yeah we don't have a, to a plane that's has, just what it is a plane has wings now if you were on a plane with no wings and it was still flying we would talk about that because that's weird <laughs> you know if and actually if you'd mentioned that this bag of peanut m m's was black and white had no intensity it had no had no vibrant yellow that i was used to that would that would oh, stand no, up was, a lot of times it's it when things are missing very yeah, yeah. <laughs> no this was a, a very clear package of peanut m ms and it's yellow packaging with the red and green with oh, yeah. the eyes and the hands Ico and <laughs> iconic yeah that, well, that's what dream symbols are icons hi hi hierographs i think um right so okay all of that to get to the very end where you mentioned emotion and you were more did you say in, indifferent was was indifferent, that, yeah. that was how you described it that so, was what i said indifferent okay. it didn't matter to me either way like i wasn't i i feel like if that had happened in real life and this is where i'm coming from i would have been like oh my god are they going to put us on the same plane is it going to get fixed are we going to go on the trip and yeah. like nothing i was just like perfectly fine just standing there with my lion it was the weather was just it, there was no wind there was no sun it wasn't cold it wasn't hot so i mean there was it was just 
it was just what it was. And it's funny that you say that it is what it is. Yeah. I say that all <laughs> the time. Yeah. And conversely, or as uh, as uh, they would say in Alice in Wonderland, uh, contrary-wise, it isn't what it's not. Uh, <laughs> a couple of things um, there. So indifference is its, its own kind of thing. And that's, that's the way a lot of people conceive of saying i didn't have strong feelings one way or the other i was i was neither happy nor fearful right you know that that kind of a thing but yes. it's it, there's also a another way to conceive of that it, and it's so there's a, the western conception that being indifferent means lacking passion it's like you don't care about anything so you're indifferent to it or if you don't care about a specific thing so you're indifferent and it's a, like a lack of care but there's a, a more uh, say eastern conception of the idea of of zen acceptance of being of detachment from emotion to the point where you can have it and it doesn't move, move you. It doesn't disturb you in a way. So that, that, that kind of, you seem to be more in a, in a place of Zen acceptance of the circumstance itself of like, it's going to be okay. This is okay. Yeah. This is, and this is I okay. will, I should note that is not normal for me mm. yeah. at all. Because whereas you have difficulty really kind of, you know, w with the emotions, I'm like off the damn scale because <laughs> I experience every emotion. And even within about 10 seconds, I can go from here to there and everywhere. Hmm. I am a very sensitive and very emotional person, but hmm. I do try to control that a little bit more so I don't take people on the crazy train with me, although it's a great <laughs> song by Ozzy. But oh, yeah. um, yeah, yeah, th that's not who I normally am. I have worked very hard to come to a place of peace and acceptance with my past, and I'm good with that. So maybe that's part of this. Could be. Yeah. But in real life, no, I, I'm very, I, you know, I, I'm emotional. I think <laughs> I think that very much th there's something of significance there because of yeah. the absence of a typical response. Um, yeah. but there's, there's a, there's a lot of atypical things going on. Well, not, maybe not a lot. Well, no, there, there's actually quite a few. You're, um, you're on a plane with the wa a very, very unrealistic seating, seating plan. You're carrying a lion mm -hmm. on a leash. The other people aren't afraid. You go to the, uh, the, 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 you know, cafe section to the bar and, and they have your favorite food that you would not expect to find on an airplane. Um, it's typical that if there were technical difficulties, they would land, but it's atypical. You'd be, you would not be fearful. It is atypical also that you would have your travel plans canceled and f be completely at peace with the whole situation, everything that just happened. Yeah. Cause I would undisturbed. Be. Yeah. You're showing <laughs> yourselves a lot of, you know, and Oh, well, I didn't even mention, yeah, the look of line on the plane, but and dre dressed way up above what you would ever consider your normal comfort, you know, so that's atypical of you as well. So there's a lot of reversals, like counterpoints to, to, I'm going somewhere I'm, with this. I don't know. Yeah, go I'm ahead. starting to make, no, this is starting to make perfect sense. I think I, I feel like it's taken us a while to get there, but I think I'm summing it up is that, you know, this, this alter ego that I joke about that, you know, has, has the nice hair, like my mother and, and the journalism to, you know, and the makeup and well-dressed and presenting and, and, you know, we'll we'll call it success even though we could have a philosophical conversation about that <laughs> taking off i am taking off my career my whatever it is my professional that alter ego is taking off but i just want to be me i just want my peanut m&ms like literally that when you said that that just resonated i just wanted my peanut m&ms and a return back and to be with my lion and i was fine yeah yeah, in in, in a way, <laughs> in, in a way, if I uh, if if I go on this journey and it doesn't work out and I just end up back where I started, like I'm okay. That's, that's okay too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and nice. that makes sense because I am, and and I think that's the part of this that I think people are trying. I think in life, people feel like they need to push and strive and more, more, yeah. and 
you know, even when you just said, you know, you're, you you have figured out and that success for you is really staying at home. I joke about that too, <laughs> because it's only been more recently that, you know, God love this man I'm married to now. I, I, I can do that. I'm trying to do what you're doing. You know, he has put us in a position and we have worked together to where I don't have to, I don't have to go get a job. I don't have, I can just stay home and write and podcast. And I mean, there are times I don't leave the house for four or five days, milk or bananas or ice cream will drive me out because the Amazon (laughs) guy can't bring those. Yeah. But you know, that to me is success. And yeah. I am, I love that. And I love that we just have our life. And so all of this makes sense to me now that, yeah, I mean, whatever happens, happens, but I don't need the more that people are always pushing me for. I hope you're making money with this. Hopefully you'll get this. You'll sell more books. You'll be on that. You'll do more podcasts. I'm fine if it all ended right now because. Mm-hmm. I've saved a lot of women. I, I, I've even men that have been in narcissistic abusive situations. Oh yeah. I have spread awareness. My 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 words are out there. My my presence is there, but it's not who I am. I'm just what did I tell you in the beginning? I'm just me. I'm just here yeah. in my house with and, my cats like you. And that's another wonderful full circle type of thing, because in the beginning you know, for, for 25 years of, of, of this marriage, you were trapped at home. Yes. And then you got the ability to travel and you went everywhere you possible. I got freedom. <laughs> I went everywhere. <laughs> and now you've come back around to, I don't feel trapped here anymore. Now I feel comfortable yeah. here. Now I don't want to leave. Now there's, you know, not that you'll never travel again, but there's no burning desire to get the hell out and go anywhere else. It's like, no, this no, is, and this is now right. this is my most comfortable place. It's funny you say that because that was the thing. We went from all balls out to a little less the next year. And my husband used to, his way of making me happy was we had a little game that when we were on our way back on the airplane from a trip, we had to decide where we were going. Where are you going to go next time? Yeah. And on the way home, (laughs) I would get the tickets and we were off. And it was planned and I had something to look forward to, but I feel like, I mean, it's funny you say that how you did, because just this morning when we were eating breakfast, I said, you know, I hate, forgive me if you're in Illinois, but I hate this God awful state (laughs) on so many levels lived here. I've been wanting to get out. I almost got out, but my husband came along and it's always about a boy. But yeah. <laughs> we stayed because his kids and grandkids are here. Oh. And of course, my son's here too, but I'm not, you know, like I'm good. Like we have Facebook and stuff and, or, you know, Zoom or whatever we want to do. But and I travel. said to him this, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I said to him this morning, I said, you know, we haven't been anywhere in a while. And, you know, I know times are a, a little tougher than they have been before, but. I said, I'm actually getting used to this. I'm actually really blessed and feeling good about this life and that, you know, I don't have to run away anymore. And so it's it, it absolutely makes sense what you just said, that I, I'm good. I'm here and I'm fine and I don't feel like I have to escape anything or run away because a lot of it was running away, I think, too. Yeah. For sure. But oh. I still would rather fly away right now to a tropical island where it's 80 some degrees and I could have a pina colada on a beach. It's, I'm just saying. It's hard. <laughs> you, you guys probably got 20 below in the last week out there, didn't you? Something like yeah, that. Yeah. 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 We, we got something it, like that. I'm in Portland, Oregon. We got below 20, which is unusual for around here. It hardly ever drops into the teens, almost never below 10 degrees. So I, I know when it's yeah. when it's below 20 here it's like negative 20 somewhere else um yeah we have been as low as negative 52 with a wind chill but that was about five or six years ago but yeah we haven't hit that yet i couldn't live there either this is bad enough i mean our our backyard has been icy for a week and i'm like that's about the the amount of snow i could take well even in (laughs) florida i still have family down there even just this past weekend some parts of florida were in the 20s and 30s Wow. And they had a weather forecast. I actually have a picture of it on my phone where they were calling for falling iguanas because when oh, it goes shit. under, <laughs> when it's <laughs> under 45 degrees, <laughs> the iguanas become immobilized. They stiffen up kind of like they're, it's like they seize, but they paralyze. 
and they fall out of the trees. So they literally well, had a I, forecast in the weather for falling iguanas. I, so I imagine was, that. I was convinced it was like some of the falling fish phenomenon where they get swept up in a little typhoon and the yeah. fish ra- <laughs> rains like miles from the coast. Like, whoa. <laughs> well, yeah, um, yeah, some crazy stuff happening. <laughs> well, do you feel like uh, there's anything we didn't quite cover thoroughly enough anything you wanted to return to uh in the dream not at all you got a pretty good narrative i'm actually really impressed this was much better than my google search i was like ask ask the wizard (laughs) you'll have to come up with the wizard but i love it because like you said there were things that you were just voicing that resonated with me very specifically and i mean i think that's what we come back to when, when we talk about what you do is that, you know, there is some symbolism, you know, that can be generalized in a way, but, but it really is a unique and and very, you know, personal experience because it's your subconscious and your past and your perspectives and what you're going through now and all these things that are manifesting in in a very strange way but it's not that strange when you really break it down yeah that's one of the things that's uh it's a it's a plus and a minus to what i do it's like dreams are fascinating because of the mystery and then we kind of solve the mystery sometimes and like oh well that's not so fascinating but now i have an answer yeah no. and so there's a there's a little a little ah, i don't know it's like solving a whodunit i mean you get the satisfaction of an answer where you're like you, you can never go back and be mystified by it ever again that one experience there will be another that's the great thing about dreams you have another one tomorrow <laughs> so exactly you get a break you get a brand watch. new mystery tonight i'll have some wild dream that i'll be like oh my god i have to call this guy <laughs> you you might i've had folks uh especially folks who have recurring dreams they come on and we talk about them we try and nail down why this format specifically why does this repeat in this way with these symbols in this sequence and then they'll they'll get back to me the next day going Oh my God, I had another dream last night and this changed this dream I've had for 20 years that was always the same. Now it's different. It was the same dream, but it wasn't now because we've solved at least some of the elements of it where they were able to move past the blockage. The once you, once you've been able to see clearly what it is, you don't have to see it like that anymore. Now you can continue no, the progress. I, yeah. I get it. It's yeah. what we were talking about with the neurons and it's what I try yeah. to help people do with, with their trauma because in order to heal from trauma, you have to change something, but changing something requires figuring out what that little piece is. And then yeah, you react differently next time. And then your neurons switch to that route and they don't go down the usual path as they always have. So it, it's all connected. Well, that is a perfect time to mention, uh, you know, once again, that uh, this is our friend Dana Diaz, and she is an author uh, with a book out, Gasping for Air, The Stranglehold of Narcissistic Abuse. I'm glad I wrote it down. I was never going to remember that. Um, you, can <laughs> find, you can find her book and more at Dana S diaz.com link in the description below um uh, and then i'll just do my little outro real quick uh would you kindly like share subscribe tell your friends uh always looking for more volunteer dreamers viewers for the game streams uh 17 currently available works of historical dream literature the most recent the fabric of dreams by Catherine taylor craig i got so many can't remember the names uh all this and more at benjamin the dream wizard.com a full list of all all the books links links to the amazon page uh also benjamin the dream wizard.locals.com uh starting a new well by the time you see this next weekend i will have already started a new video game but you can go there and get the most recent uh custom cocktail for each video game i play uh this one coming up is it's entitled rocket fuel because i'm playing guardians of the galaxy uh and one of the characters is rocket raccoon long story short i'm shilling at length again uh i'm just gonna go back to dana thank you for being here Uh, very enjoyable to talk to you thank you so much for having me i appreciate it good deal and the last thing to say is uh for everybody out there thanks for watching